and just preparing to stream. Thank you. I think we are live streaming now. So I'll say good afternoon to members of the committee and supporting officers and thank you for your attendance this afternoon at our July Planning Policy Committee. Um, I'll press on to the record of attendance and hand over to Joanne who will do the ro roll call. If you could unmute and uh, let us know that you're here, um, I'd be very grateful. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. If you could just confirm, councillors, if you are present. Councillor Tom Ashton. Present. Councillor Sid Dennis. Present. Thank you. Councillor Carleen Dickinson. Present. Councillor Will Grover. Present. Councillor Tony Howard. Present. Councillor Thomas Kemp. Present. Councillor Helen Matthews. Present. Councillor Makinson Sanders. Yes, I'm here. Councillor McNally. Present. And Councillor Phil Smith. Present. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joanne. Could we possibly have a um, an update on absences, apologies and substitutions, please? Uh, yeah, so apologies for absence today are from Councillor Steve McMillan uh, and Councillor Jimmy Brooks. Uh, Councillor Jill Makinson Sanders will be substituting for Councillor McMillan. Thank you. And, I'll let... and Tom, can we also note, please, that um, at your invitation, Councillor Mossop is all, also with us today. Yes, I was just coming to that. I was going to say thank Sorry. you and welcome, um, Councillor Mason Sanders. I hope you enjoy your time with us this afternoon and um, also extend a warm welcome to Councillor Edward Mossop, um, who is joining us as a guest. Um, it's always been our practice when we've met in person that if other members of the council who are not on planning policy have an interest in items on our agenda, then they are welcome um, to. Um, come to the meetings, their public meetings at the end of the day, and if they'd like to make a contribution on something that they feel very strongly about, then I, am, as chairman, am content to use my discretion to allow them to speak um, on those issues. Um, so thank you very much for that. I'll move on to item two, which is disclosure of interests, if any. Does anyone have any interests that they wish to declare on the items on the agenda today? If you could indicate with your little hand function, please. Seeing none, I'll say if there is anything that arises during the meeting, please indicate and we'll take your declaration there. And moving on to item three, which is to confirm the minutes of the meeting held on the 21st of May 2020. I will take these as having been read and if I have no indications on corrections or otherwise, I'll move from the chair that we accept, accept those minutes. Um, and I look for a second. Mm. Councillor Matthews, thank you. Um, I'd like to second, yeah. Thank you very much, Councillor Matthews. Um, I have no one else indicating to speak. Um, so could we take a just to make sure we're practiced on the roll call we'll take a roll call vote on the minutes if we could please joanne if you could confirm please and um, that you are for these minutes councillor uh, tom ashton for councillor sid dennis for councillor carleen dickinson for councillor will grover for Councillor Tony Howard. For Councillor Thomas Kemp. For Councillor Helen Matthews. For Councillor Makinson Sanders. Well, as I wasn't present at the meeting, I don't know if there are a true record, I'm afraid. Okay. <laughs> Councillor McNally. For and Councillor Smith. Oh. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
we'll move on to item four, which is climate change and environment, the local plan review, and we'll receive a report from Sarah, um, who's our climate change and environment manager. So I'll hand over to Sarah if I could please. Thank you. So yeah, I think the feeling was it would be useful for committee to receive a report that gave you a bit of an outline of the climate change and environment service area with it being a, a new area for the council in terms of having a dedicated person in post to provide advice and support. Um, and I also wanted to just run through some of the key areas of the environment bill that I think are particularly person to this committee. Um, and in terms of, of both those areas really to then think about the implications in terms of the local plan to take forward some elements of that work. Um, hopefully you've all had a chance to look through the report. I, I'm not gonna go through every, every paragraph of it in detail. I'll run through kind of some of the key areas and then I think it might just be easier if, if anybody has any questions to have a, a bit of a discussion following that. Um, so as a brief recap, I've been in post since April of this year. Um, and as I said, really that the idea of my role is to provide advice and support in terms of um, developing environment policy uh, and that to include climate change, carbon reduction, sustainability, etc. cetera. Um, in terms of wider context, context, the Environment Bill was published in January 2020 um, and prior to COVID-19 was making its way through the committee stages. Now, obviously that has been delayed and we don't know at what point that will be picked back up again, but I think we need to work on the basis that it will be and that we will have an Environment Act in the not too distant future. Um, I think given the, the calls for the green recovery around COVID-19, it probably adds a little bit of additional impetus to that in some respects. So um, I certainly think we, we will expect to see that coming forward. I think the key headlines um, on that really are around uh, the mandating of biodiversity net gain. Um, I've spoken quite a bit in, in various meetings and things um, before that this is a significant development. It will be a challenge both for the council and for developers, I think it's fair to say. Um, that doesn't mean that it should be viewed in any way as, an, as a burden, um, but it will take a strategic approach. It will take a lot of time and effort to make sure that we get it right, because ultimately it should be able to deliver some quite positive outcomes for the district if it's done in the right way. Um, there are likely to be exemptions around um, net gain in terms of developments. We don't exactly know what they will be as yet. There have been some suggestions that it could be, for example, only applicable to development sizes over 10 homes. But again, so we don't really know fully what that will be as yet. Other parts of that um, environment bill that I think are particularly key are the intention to strengthen the biodiversity duty on local authorities. So we currently have a duty under the Natural Environment and Rural Communities Act 2006 to have regard for biodiversity. The intention of the bill is to strengthen that, to um, require local authorities to require conservation and enhancement of biodiversity. So again, that really is potentially quite a significant change that we need to bear in mind. Alongside that, the bill then calls for local nature recovery strategies. And again, we don't quite know fully what the role of local authorities will be in that, but we need to assume that we will have to take those into account. Um, they have stated in the bill that those strategies should support strategic planning for housing and infrastructure and help direct net gain investments so it has the greatest benefit for wildlife and people. Um, in Lincolnshire, we know that the, the previous biodiversity action plan that expires this year is being reviewed and they, uh, the partnership putting that together is looking at doing that in line with what a local nature recovery strategy should be. Um, as I say, the actual detail of, of the size area that they will cover and whether each local authority will have to have its own version or whatever, we don't quite know as yet. But again, it's certainly something that needs to be in mind. 
just to give a bit of the wider national context to say, as I'm sure you are all aware, the UK government did declare a climate change and environment emergency. And we have a national target to be net zero in terms of emissions by 2050. More local context, this council on the 22nd of July will consider a recommendation to be net zero by 2040 um, and to require a minimum reduction in emissions of 45% by 2027. That is a pretty ambitious target. Um, it's great that we are being so ambitious, but it is going to require significant change uh, and a significant programme of work to get there. And while that target stems from the development of a carbon management plan looking at our own direct operational assets, there has been a very clear steer from the top of this authority that we should be leading by example um, and setting a good example to the wider district in terms of this. So I think we do need to consider in terms of the local plan that it needs to bear in mind the targets that we have um, because it would it would not set a very good example if it didn't try and achieve that in itself. Um, so it really needs to be given quite serious thought. Um, alongside that, obviously, we, we do have the new strategic aim in the corporate strategy um, of adapting to meet the challenge of a changing natural environment as well. So there are quite a lot of, of hooks there in terms of uh, this climate change and environment agenda um, and quite a lot that the local plan, I think, needs to consider in terms of that going forward. Um, to give a little bit more detail in terms of biodiversity net gain, it, the, the review of the MPPF did away with avoiding net loss of biodiversity um, and included provision for net gain. So, so that even though we haven't yet got that Environment Act in place, I think we can be fairly certain that this will be coming forward and it is the way that things are going. Um, the MPPF also states now that plans should take a strategic approach to maintaining and strengthening networks of habitats and green infrastructure and plan for the enhancement of natural capital at a catchment or landscape scale across local authority boundaries. And I think that, so this idea of a strategic approach, this idea of not necessarily just being focused on smaller areas, but actually working at that landscape scale is really important. And the inclusion of that natural capital consideration. So thinking about the ecosystem services that we derive from those habitats, it's no longer just about providing for biodiversity, but it is about the climate change. It's about the health and well-being. It's about so much more now. Um, and again, local plan policy really needs to consider that. Um, I think one, well, in terms of net gain, as I said earlier, it is going to be a, con a new concept to most developers. And we need to make sure that we can, there is a lot to consider around that. Um, we need to make sure that we can provide them with a clear approach. I think that will be a combination of on-site and off-site um, net gain. Um, I would not want to see a situation where, for ease, everything was delivered off-site. Um, I think we need to make sure that, that we are still seeking the opportunities to do that. I appreciate in Nice and Zeno, quite often we're talking about small scale development and low land values, but we need to, we need to still be quite ambitious and recognise that actually providing net gain on site has its own benefits as well. But that isn't to say that there isn't a need for off-site provision. And again, there could be potentially, if it's delivered in the right way, some quite exciting opportunities to do some larger scale schemes as well, perhaps. But that just shows the scale really of what we need to consider in terms of that approach. Obviously, with all of this, the evidence base is going to be important. Um, and I've pushed quite hard since coming in um, for this council to undertake a biodiversity opportunity mapping exercise. Um, I'll explain what that is a little bit more in a moment. Um, we've sort of had verbal agreement of that and I'm just waiting for a final sign off so that we can move forward with that. But essentially what that exercise does is it identifies the core areas of habitat, of existing habitat and ecological networks across the district. Um, and then it uses those to seek out where the greatest opportunities lie to either enhance through improve management um, or create new habitats. Um, 
And again, that is important because it, it provides a strategic method of thinking about it. It works at a landscape scale. I think it will be important in terms of the evidence base for the local plan. I think it will be important in terms of looking at where net gain could potentially be best delivered. Um, and those ecological networks are really important in terms of building resilience to climate change because it enable, it gives that space um, for species to adapt, etc. My view uh, and one of the recommendations in this report is that in terms of net gain, we will probably need an SPD um, for that. Um, I think, as I say, we need to be very clear about what we will expect and how net gain needs to be delivered. I also think there could be quite a tight time scale, potentially, depending on when an environment, the Environment Act receives royal assent. We don't have all the detail of, of how net gain will need to be delivered as yet from a, from a national perspective. Um, so I think it, it may well be that an SPD gives us a little bit of flexibility in terms of time as well to make sure that we can get that right. Um, in terms of climate change, some people have heard me say already, I think we really need to think about this as running as a bit of a golden thread in terms of the local plan. I think it needs to run through everything. Um, if we're to meet both the national and the local targets that we're setting in terms of um, emissions and you know, in terms of that climate change agenda, then we're going to have to be a lot more ambitious than we have been. And, and every policy is going to need to consider what its impact is. Um, and that's really why I've, I've put it again in the recommendations that I think both net gain and climate change need to be given serious consideration in terms of the issues and options for the local plan. And um, they are both key strategic issues. Um, and I do think that you know, the stakeholder engagement will be important. I think that there are a lot of different things that we can look to do. The climate change agenda as a whole, you know, carbon emissions, sustainability, again, it, it's perhaps easier in some of the bigger cities um, compared to, to East Lindsay, as I say, where, you know, in terms of development, we're always up against uh, kind of low margins and low land values, etc. But I think we do need to make sure that we seek out the opportunities for East Lindsay. Um, and they may well be sort of smaller wins here and there, but we need to identify what they are um, and find the areas that we can make a difference. Um, so I think that there is, again, a lot of work to be done around that. And I'm not sitting here today to tell you that I have all the answers to that either, but it's just highlighting that we really do need to give this quite thorough consideration. Um, it is probably just worth me mentioning as well, I had a, a conversation with the County Council this morning um, around this and they are doing some work with the Central Lincolnshire Local Plan team. Um, and they have agreed to support that in um, looking at developing a carbon baseline for the whole of Lincolnshire and actually being able to provide all of the districts and areas with um, data that's appropriate to their area on that. Um, details sketchy at the moment they're literally just about to add that onto an existing tender and um, should know a little bit more in a couple of weeks um but i think that will be again a useful evidence base for us um, and something that we will we'll need to consider as well um so i think as i say in summary hopefully i haven't <laughs> waffled on too much and jumped around there's quite a lot to uh, to think about um and i'm happy to take any any questions and go into areas in a little bit more detail but hopefully that kind of gives the the key points and a good overview of, of where things are at. Thank you very much Sarah and absolutely no waffle at all it's an excellent report a lot of really good stuff in this and a um, and, and a very clear um, presentation that you've just given on it. Um, I say that contained in this is a genuinely good opportunity for us in, in East Lindsay to improve our built and natural environment. And I would, I am really, really keen to see us seize whatever opportunities we have um, and whatever opportunities we may find in the legislation that we expect is going to come to improve the quality and layout and design of properties that are currently being built. I think one of the greatest challenges to um, ensuring community acceptance of development when it comes is that, that development is as nice as what it can be for not only the people that are going to live in it but for the people that 
um, live in the community around it. Um, and it's heartening to hear that we're going to put a focus on the areas where we can make a difference, which I think for me um, really suggests that we appreciate and understand the geography that we've got um, in East Lindsay, the fact that the private motor vehicle, that um, um, demon um, long since uh, targeted by the MPPF is something that we, we, we aren't going to be able to get rid of um, in East Lindsay simply because of the, 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 the area that we, that we have to cover and the um, nature of the communities that we've got. But being able to focus on the things that we can make a difference on um, is, is, is something I'm sure we'll all welcome. Um, and I fully endorse um, further to the comments I was just making, um, looking to, take, to get some of this net gain on site um, because I think that's key to enhancing the quality of the design and the layout. Um, but I'll open it up for questions and debate, and I have Councillor Tony Howard indicating. First, Councillor Howard. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I think they, with, with developers, the idea of net gain is going to be an absolutely different way of thinking that they've got to... Uh, take on board and I'm sure some will, will grasp it straight away however I, I do believe that it's going to be down to us to get the message out get it out early and get people on board with it as soon as possible um, because um, the one thing people are always resistant to is change um, and you know we've, we've often heard it said you know that we can't build flood resistant houses because they're, you know, the, the market wouldn't take the hit. Well, hang on a minute, you know, the, the, there are, um, uh, there is an opportunity here to get the message out early to say that, hang on, everybody is going to be involved in this net gain. There isn't, you know, it, it isn't a case that the market can't stand it or any other reason for it. This has got to happen. This is um, a, a new way of thinking. It is the rules of the game from now on. Uh, and I also think it's very important that um, it would be very simple for developers to pass the book in, in, in a sense and say everything can be done off site. Again, get in early, get the education into them and say, no, that's not the way it's going to be done. And, you know, really put your minds to this and deliver some, some net gain on site, the majority of it on site, if at all possible. I think. There's also an opportunity for us to develop um, some partnerships. And I'm thinking particularly of with the drainage board where they have uh, an input into development uh, and they also have a history now of land drainage and conservation alongside. So they have already um, issues where they have to meet different targets and on different uh, ideals. Of one of moving water, one of looking after the of, after the wildlife. So I think there's an opportunity for us there to develop a, a really strong partnership in delivering this. And I have to say that I think that the, the whole thing is summed up by uh, points three seven, three eight, three nine in the report. Three seven adapting and mitigating to climate change should act as a golden thread running through the local plan. Now, if ever there was a, a simple sentence that sums, sums something up absolutely succinctly, I think that's it. And I think the further acknowledgement that carbon emissions are not the be all and end all of this, um, and that climate change policy must really run deep, I think uh, are essential messages that we really, really, really have got to push on from now on. Uh, fully um, go with the uh, three recommendations at the end of the report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Howard. I have Councillor Macon from Sanders next, please.
your muted council make it some sound. You, I pressed it and it didn't work. Um, I don't want to see any more appalling housing schemes like the one in Horncastle earlier in this year. I think all of, all housing schemes must in future have landscaping as a condition. And as a condition, this landscaping must be kept up because let's have all our new housing um, developments breathing and giving, you know, it, they look prettier, they look better. It's much better for people to, to live with nature. Um, I'm a bit concerned about biodiversity because um, I don't, I've got a horror of rats and mice and I don't want those to be included, please, in your list of uh, biodiversity. I've had enough of those. And uh, um, I did find a frog in the house the other day and I've got a lot of spiders because it's raining. So I think we can take it slightly too far. Um, I brought something up on my on my other computer here it's a report that's just come out by um british architects and um there's some really interesting bits in it um that we we ought to be following and one of them should make this council think about spending 8.25 million or whatever they're telling us it is and it's upgrade existing buildings for extended use um as a more carbon efficient alternative to demolition and new build wherever there is a viable choice. And there's a lot we can be doing with that. We've got a lot of old housing stock. Um, um, this architect's report was quite right. It was signed by 80 firms of architects in this country. Um, it, it really is worth reading that. Um, it's all about regenerative um, design principles, et cetera, et cetera. It's a really good report and we should be taking that on board. Um, green corridors were very much the vogue 10 years ago, I don't know what happened to those because I I could have envisaged a green corridor to be parochial going through Louth. Um, it'd be nice if we can get support from the council to be doing things like that. And uh, I think if there's one thing that lockdown has taught us, it's that the natural environment becomes really, really important again in our lives. And I think we shouldn't let that disappear when life returns to whatever the new normal is going to be. So um, I support these things, but I would like to see us be a lot stronger on uh, read that report from the architects because they're the people with the knowledge as well. And um, the other thing I was going to ask, you're, you're going to have a consultant, but you're paying VAT. I didn't think councils paid VAT. So that was my last query on that bit, but that's not the most important bit. I would like to see something built in right from now that we landscape all our big new developments and, and, and for, the, for a condition that that landscaping isn't just to be for five years, it's got to continue. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Makers and Founders. We're not, but we, we, we do generally um, share similar views on development needing to be pretty and attractive wherever it possibly can be. And certainly in my view, if through requiring net gain or at least some net gain um, to be on site, then if we can if, if we can use that as the lever by which we get green space and trees and things on new developments, then um, that has my full support. Um, Councillor Smith is the next speaker, then Councillor Matthews. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think broadly I agree with that so far and indeed with the content of the report. One of the things I was a little um, surprised by in the report was at the beginning in the section on risk, uh, where obviously our key risk is the environment bill and, and contravening that in some manner, um, because it strikes me that there's a massive raft of guidance on climate change, which in our last uh, local plan, we utterly failed to to recognise, and I, I don't know the old officers, but I am aware that that, that, that Paul and Tim are very, very sort of um, led by their statutory responsibilities and the way in which we can use our statutory instruments. So I'm hoping that now we are better equipped to really address those um, those elements of uh, that, that have been statutory for a, for a very long time. You know, um, and I'm thinking of um, you know. Sarah mentioned that, that, that climate change is on thread through the thing. Well, we are statutorily required to do that. You know, um, 
the Planning and Compulsory Purchase Act of 2004, an ancient piece of documentation, says um, development plans, documents um, uh, must include policies designed to secure the development and use of land um, and contributes to the mitigation and adaption to climate change. And then the Planning Act of 2008 and the Climate Change Act of 2008 go on to talk about both um, improvement and mitigation in those. Um, and, and then the, the other thing that Sarah was talking about was um, the need for good spatial planning and all of our more recent um, legislation entirely talks about that as um, being key to our, not key, but statutorily required for our, um, our planning in terms of, um, of carbon and climate change. So, uh, um, uh, and, and not only that, that, it, that we should be proactive in that, that we should be, um, and it, it, it actually says that we should be going beyond what the current legislation is to be constantly pushing as an authority. Um, and I think that that's, uh, that's really, you know, particularly in the um, in the, uh, the the national planning policy framework, the new one. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I entirely think that. But I, I, I do think that I think Sarah said that we need a significant change to um, to our, our policy, and I think that needs to be a cultural change from us as much as anything else. And I'm hoping that that some of our new officers can lead in that because um, it appears to me from the old plan, which mentioned the environment and carbon, but once in its entire um, length uh, that, um, that, that it clearly wasn't being considered at every step previously and it needs to be from now on. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Matthew. All right, can you hear me? Oh, oh just lost my notes. Um, well, I think as a district rich in natural capital, um, it's a real opportunity for us, this is, um, actually to be a pioneer in council. You know, we can actually lead the way um, on the net gain and climate change if we change our attitudes. And I think the thing is, this isn't just about doing more of the same and planting a few more trees. This is bigger, broader, wider. You know, there's a natural, you know, attitudinal change where actually nothing is more important than the air that we breathe. And we need to start, you know, putting that ahead of everything we do. So it should be about clean, um, smarter designs, cleaner energy within these buildings. It should be about when we get the mapping documents back that we look at the corridors, um, we enhance the corridors, we double them. You know, if there's a nature reserve nearby, we quadruple that. You know, let's really get on, on board this. Um, and I, again, like the golden thread, you know, and I know you've done your recommendations, um, Sarah, which are very good, um, but somewhere within there, I'd like to take out words like consideration or needs to be developed and put things like embedded. But at this stage, we need to be embedding it and making sure that we actually get on board it, start now, um, no tokenism. Let's really, really grasp it because we are an absolutely amazing district. We've got the ocean on one side giving us clean air. We're unspoiled. Our remoteness you know, is a, a bonus really for our wildlife and the, the diversity we have in this district. So I think, you know, it is a real opportunity. So I, I'm very excited, but we need to embed what's going on in the environmental bill almost like from now. And I don't know whether there's opportunity within your recommendation, Sarah, somehow to get the word embedded in, or maybe on the second one, um, but just have a think about it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Matthews. Councillor Sid Dennis. Yeah, good afternoon all. Um, I admire your, your wonderful sense of, of, of where you want to move forward and how you want to do it. And how you're very, very good at spending other people's money. Because at the end of the day, uh, the developers are the kind of people that's going to have to foot this bill and although it might be fantastic and a wonderful idea and we all want to save the planet, we can become that good of a council that nobody want to come here because it ain't going to pay. Because at the end of the day, it's got to pay. So you just need just to, all of you, wind your necks in a bit and, and just bear in mind it's, there's got to be a balance put in there because, you know, I'm all for, well, from what I understand about net zero, I could do, I could do it actually, Sarah Baker sending me a, 
a, a little remiss of what, how all this happens because I, I do have a distinct lack of understanding about the carbon footprint is this and the carbon footprint is that I really don't know how it sounds and, and things like SPD which I don't understand there's a lot of things I don't understand I hope you don't think I'm an ignoramus but I really don't grasp it I, I could do with a little bit of a, a quiz telling me what this is or, or a remit to tell you in layman's terms what this actually means it's all right putting trees in here and green swathes through there that's so much an acre and how much you I want to know how all this adds up into pounds, shillings and pence, because at the end of the day, if you don't pay, it don't happen. So it's no good as being the most wonderful council in the world with all the most wonderful ideas. We've still got to make it economically viable. I hope you don't think I'm putting um, a, a damp squib on all of this. I'm just trying to maybe bring in, sit in here, a little bit of reality, probably. Hopefully. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dennis. Um, I think it probably might be more helpful um, if you pick up some of these bits with Sarah um, as a to, to, to understand um, some of these bits outside of the meeting. Um, but I think it's a valid challenge that you raise in the any additional cost uh, placed on development always have a more significant impact in an area like East Lindsay where property values are generally lower. And one of the challenges we're always going to have with any kind of development is if you buy your parcel of land and build the house on it to the required standard and then sell it, you're going to make more profit per house or per acre. If you're building in the home counties or in the south of England, then you're going to make if you're building in East Lindsay. So it's always there's always going to be a challenge there. Um, and it's something that we do need to recognise. But at the same time, if we can get to a situation where the houses that are being built, the developments that are coming forward, are that little bit nicer, then I'd like to think people are going to be a bit keener on living in them. Um, so hopefully that that thread will run through. But I, I, I take your point that we do need to be careful not to end up with development in East Lindsay being unattractive or unprofitable or unviable. But there is some degree of security that if this is national legislation and it's happening everywhere, then it is simply going to be a new standard that's expected across the country. Um, so we won't be at so much of a disadvantage in this area. Uh, are there any points that you'd like to pick up on that before I go on to the next speaker, Sarah? No, I don't think so. I'm, yeah, happy to, to have a, a chat outside of the meeting, that's fine. Thank you. Um, Councillor Mossop, then Councillor Matthews. Yeah, um, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you, Chairman, for allowing me to speak. I did send you a, a, a message, actually, uh, give, outlining my point that I wanted to raise. Um, Sarah, I wanted to ask you the question about habitat mapping because we do actually have all this information already at our behest in, um, in the DEFRA website under MAGIC. All, the, all our habitats are, are, are thoroughly mapped, all the, the SSSIs, all the- Not everything. Um, Not everything. Well, as much as we can, yeah. um, I thought- it was a join up. Yeah. Sorry, who, who's saying that? Oh, did I? <laughs> Sorry, I'm I, sorry. I, I I got some interruption, um, but yeah, it does. It it may be that it doesn't join up. But if you look at all the layers, it is it, 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 all that information is there. Um, and I'm just conscious that we may have we we don't need to be re repeating ourselves and duplicating uh, this information without um, uh, without undue costs on uh, on on the council. So I was just wondering what the process was, Sarah, about this habitat mapping. Is it that you're going to put additionality into to what is already there um, with some proposals. Um, and also I think the recommendations are, are, are fine and the task and finish group to discuss that gain is the place where we need to be um, getting into the nitty gritty of the costs of all this in, in terms of um, what it is to developers because yes, there is a hard reality uh, to all this in terms of what uh, has been outlined by Councillor Sid. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah, would you like to pick up on those bits, please? 
Yeah, that's fine. Um, so in terms of the habitat mapping, yeah, um, DEFRA does have uh, what's called a priority habitats inventory. Um, the priority habitats inventory is incredibly out of date. Um, it doesn't have the most up-to-date information in it. There is quite a lot missing. Uh, I know from my previous role, part of that comes because uh, Natural England has never been able to negotiate a new deal with um, local record centres to provide that information because of um, open data restrictions. Um, so in terms of getting the most comprehensive data set, that is only held by Lincolnshire Environmental Records Centre. Um, so yet that you know there is habitat mapping from the triple SIs, which actually incidentally still aren't comprehensively um, habitat mapped by anybody. Um, but they do have far more information. They they uh, undertake local site surveys themselves, um, and so all of that habitat mapping um, goes into that system as well. So they do by far hold the most comprehensive set. So it does seem a little bit bizarre to suggest that triple SIs aren't comprehensively habitat mapped, but that they aren't. Um, it, it is a strange one. Um, and in terms of, of the funding, so the funding that the, the cost of that isn't just for purchasing that data, if you like. Um, what's actually been done is to use that data as the basis for um, a bespoke program, which um, looks at what is surrounding the habitats. It looks at uh, the agricultural land classifications. Um, it looks at other um, factors in terms of then putting forward the, the most appropriate areas for those opportunities. Um, it also works on a system a lot of there's been very, there are various methods of doing biodiversity opportunity mapping that they've been done up and down the country and um, a lot of them use um, like a radius um, around a point and um, so it means when you come to an urban area um, a large area will have, may have been identified as an opportunity but half of it goes through a building and um, the system that's been developed by um, the Greater Lincolnshire Nature Partnership um, in Lincolnshire and um, works on uh, polygons without so we're getting into the technical data detail of the mapping, um, but so the, it makes sure that the sites it identifies are sensible because it works to field boundaries and things like that. Um, so I say it is a bespoke system, but it is one that uh, I think when about five or six local authorities um, in Lincolnshire have now taken up. So the other advantage of it, of using them for this process, isn't only that they hold the most comprehensive data set, but it also then means that we're working from the same uh, methodology as the rest of the county so when we talk then about you know not just necessarily stopping at local authority boundaries although I appreciate you know our main focus is going to be East Lindsay it does mean that we're all joined up so we're all using the same the same system and looking at the same uh, opportunities if you like. Okay thank you for that. Thank you very much I'll just bring Simon in who's indicated that he'd like to speak. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you, Chairman. I was only just to briefly touch on the points raised about the issues and options um, and, and possibly changing the recommendation. I, I think it's important to realise that, that these aren't options. The, these are requirements. Net gain is going to be a mandatory requirement. Enhancement of biodiversity is already built into the MPPI. The, these are requirements. And I think I've already had some very detailed discussions with Sarah about the, the, the sort of ways we can deal with this. Um, certainly the policies do need looking at um, and the idea of a golden thread running through the, obviously it, the environment is already one of the three strands in the MPPF um, uh, which, which is a golden thread almost running through through the planning uh, system already um, I think that idea is, is a good one um, and I think looking at the policies and, and, and how we can adjust those and, and review those to, to, to strengthen that is certainly a good thing um, I say I've been working quite closely with Sarah and we've, we've discussed various methods and things like supplementary planning documents, the, the SPDs uh, that, that Councillor Dennis was, was, was um, uh, looking at and discussing. The, the, the SPDs are a good way to actually build on the information in the local plan. So you have your, your policy there which sets out the framework and that's the vehicle for delivering these things on the ground. You then have your supplementary planning documents which adds in a lot of additional information for developers for agents to look at how they can implement the requirements of that policy and then you actually have the planning decision making process which then looks at what's sort of come in and, and determines whether that that net gain and enhancements have been have been made um, so I, I, i'm not sure the issues and options is the right place to look at it really i, I don't think it is optional i think this is something that we we need to work on uh, quite 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 hard anyway um irrespective of, of the issues and options that was all i, I just wanted to Thank you. I think that gives 
some degree of reassurance that the recommendations that we've got um, are robust in, uh, and, and, and satisfies, I hope, um, some of the concerns that Councillor Matthew had. But I have Councillor Matthews indicating to speak next, so um, I'll hand over to you. Just that, um, going back to what Sid was saying about um, understanding it, from what I understand with the natural capita, it's almost like putting a monetary value on the nature that's around you and the nitrogen in the soil and the clean air and things like that. Um, and, and those, in the early days, the white paper, were gonna be taking a measure as a measure of maybe additional funding as, as we've sort of left leaving Brexit and um, left Brexit um, and things will come out to support the natural environment and natural capita is a way of like um, capturing the monetary value of these essential things that you know help with climate change um so it, it's it's i don't know have we had training on it here sarah i don't know but it, it's really it, it's it's quite interesting when you get into what what they're trying to do and the the approach to the environment because it, it's quite different to something we've ever seen before Thank you. I have uh, Councillor Howard, um, Councillor Mason Sanders, Councillor Smith, and then Councillor Dennis. So, Councillor Howard. Thank you. Um, yes, with, with regard to what Councillor Dennis was saying, um, it's, it, it, it's a, it is a basic point that, yes, um, at the end of the day, uh, whatever is built has to show a profit. But I think the, the I go back to what I was saying about education. If developers understand that this is the new rules of the game and that this is what customers are going to actually be wanting, especially younger buyers as they come into the market, they, they have probably got more of a green conscience uh, than what we old footy duddies have. Um, and, you know, we've got to get that basic message across appeal to their basic instinct i.e that of making a profit and we've got to point out that if they make their developments more desirable on the new program of, of rules and regulations then they are going to make more profit at the end of the day because they are satisfying what the market will be demanding um, and i think if we we get that get the message out there with education to the developers early on very first thing, the good ones will grasp it and realise that they're going to be a step ahead in the marketplace. Thank you, Councillor Megan and Sanders. Councillor Megan and Sanders, we can't hear you that is i did press it sorry i'll start again um i i do think we should we should concentrate in east lindsay on quality and not quantity um i think that's really important and slums aren't acceptable in the 21st century and uh, sadly a lot of developers would build poor quality estates and they must up their game and we're just going to have to tell them that it's not acceptable to do what they've done in the past and i know profit is important but profit will will follow it. Um, they don't do that in other parts of the country. And, you know, I, just because we've got a lot of space here doesn't mean to say we, they can get away with stuff. Um, I don't, you know, it's not always going to be a low economy. In Spain, they only ever allow architects to design estates and buildings. We just have people that are, uh, don't have any qualifications because when you learn, to, when you spend seven years training to be an architect, you understand about spatial requirements. It's a different, you know, you understand about how you should put these things together. And I think developers really need, they do need to up their game. The other thing that drives me to distraction about East Lindsay is we are grabbing farmland. This country needs to eat and we do need to keep our farmland. I will always stick up for the farmers on this. They are in their game. So um, I, I really do have a problem with those farmland to keep falling and falling and falling in the areas. You know, we know they want to develop at the coast. So let's let's be adventurous and design things that are right for along the coastal strip. And then the Environment Agency can't whinge about it. Um, 
I, uh, I heard Sarah speak, uh, speak about the, um, the salt marsh at the executive board. Um, that makes me a bit sad, really, because um, it was a lottery scheme at East Lindsay. They had three or four officers working on, on the Lincolnshire salt marsh. I think that's gathering dust on the shelf somewhere. And I really think a lot of their work, and it was a heritage lottery funded, don't lose it. Um, Joe's still around. I know. I don't know about uh, the other people, but certainly we should be we should be using that expertise that was that was brought into the council. Salt marshes. You look at in Wales what they do with their salt marsh animals, and they sell those at a premium. Why aren't we developing stuff like that? Um, that's that's an added bonus, isn't it? And the last thing I want to say is I'd like to give some of my community cash this year towards a community orchard. So Sarah, can you hurry up and tell me where I can put one in love, please? <laughs> because I think they're really, really good. And um, the more the merrier. So I'd like to spend some money on it. So I'm going to keep plaguing you over that one. Thank you. Thank you. And I think that there is an opportunity here if we have to now start looking at how we do development differently how we build more efficiently. And if there's a challenge on the cost of building some of these developments, I would really like to see, instead of the uh, mass ranks of, uh, of, of, of small boxes of semi-detached and detached properties, where it may be detached, but there's such a small difference, uh, small gap between each property, um, you can't hardly walk down there, let alone admire the brickwork, where you've got external walls, where you've got inefficiencies in insulation, inefficiencies in heating because you've got external walls, you're having to spend all of that money on material to make external walls, um, to finish off the roofs at each end, whereas actually if we were in, if, if there is a means of promoting the terrace house, I think there are genuine advantages um, of economic efficiency, of thermal efficiency, and there might just be enough room on the site to do something nice with trees, and there might be enough room in the budget of building that property to do something nice with the appearance of it. I would much, much sooner see a really nicely done terrace and the savings that can be made in that kind of building um, repeat what our Victorian ancestors did and do them as nicely as they can. And then people want to live in them and, in, and, 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 and take a degree of pride in them. Um, but that's just a personal bugbear of mine. Um, I am not entirely sure um, I will live to see it enacted into policy, but if there is something in what we are looking at here that gives us a bit of leverage to encourage it, um, then I'm certainly keen on us doing that. Um, I have Councillor Smith next. Thank you. And although it wasn't what I was uh, planning to say, um, I've just got to echo what Tom says there about uh, terraces. And uh, um, and I would point out anyone travelling to Leicester, which obviously isn't a particularly good idea at the moment, um, as you go into Leicester from the north, the mock Georgian terraces that they have in beautiful sweeping curves as you go in. I think they look terrible because they're, they're in imitation in a poor way of a previous style. But it does show that you can build terraces on a grand scale and sell them for top dollar. Um, admittedly, in a big city, and we have slightly different arrangements here, but that it does really show certain elements of, 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 of real thought in design around those issues that Tom mentions in terms of thermal efficiency and, uh, and, and, and economic efficiency as well. Um, the thing I was going to mention was um, to slightly contradict Tom in fact, um, was to pick up on his comment earlier on about transport and how wedded to the car we are. Um, again in terms of this uh, the notions of spatial planning, I would encourage us all to have a quick look at the Department of Transport's um, decarbonising transport document which came out in March of this year um, to no fanfare whatsoever because we had other things on our on our plates um, but that's a, a document which talks about decarbonising transport um, and using spatial development to do that and whilst we would all love to have a train pull up outside our house and take us wherever we wanted that's not possible but a key element of that document is talking about planning policy and ensuring that we have good um, broadband connection 
throughout all of our new developments so that people can work from home and work differently in, in, in ways which we have been forced to do now. I was having a conversation just before this meeting started with some of our officers about how terrible our internet connections are and how very tenuous our ability to attend these meetings are. Um, but that could all change and it could all change at the behest of planning. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Smith. And I, by what, by, it's interesting what you say, and a paper which will um, come to this committee, a discussion that I've already had um, with Sarah and with Simon, is to revisit the scoreboard by which we uh, calculate sustainability of settlements. Um, because one of the things that I've picked up in there for a very long time is that we place relatively little weight on things like a shopper bus route where you can actually live in that settlement and you can use public transport. It may not be a fantastic service or a high frequency service, but it is a service nonetheless. And um, I would be keen for us to give additional weight to that. Um, and the same remarks as to locations where there are primary schools particularly small primary schools and in some of our smaller settlements where those primary schools usually have the space because there's a part that there's land adjacent to them land near them where they can expand if they need to do but more often and in in, in many cases they are taking their pupils from, um, from further afield and one of the highest frequency journeys that any family is going to make if that family has children is taking them to and from school if there isn't a um if there isn't a bus provided so i'm i'm keen that as a committee we look at that or possibly set up um another um reference group or working group to look through that and try and make what we are scoring and what we are regarding as material for sustainability reflects both what we're trying to achieve um, in this paper, but also reflects the feel of our district and how people actually work and, 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 and live their lives. I mean, I, I, I'll simply end my point there um, that we have settlements on that, 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 that are storing one for a cemetery um, and two for a church. And, 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 and perhaps we just sort of need to take into account whether we're um, where we're at with some of those. So I'll move on to Councillor Dennis. Thank you, Chairman. I wasn't trying to put the damper on it, ladies and gentlemen. What I was trying to say was that if you're in an HMO or you're in a bed sit and you're in a, in a, in a bad way and, you're, and you're, you've got nowhere to live, you know, some of these little boxes we're talking about are quite shiny and brand new to these people and, and certainly a step up from where they are at the moment. And it is true to say that the youth of today have a, have a very, have, have a carbon footprints and carbon saving and catastrophe of the world in their minds, but they have very little in their wallets. That's the problem. But we're looking at supplying affordable things and we just need to get a balance in them because these kids need housing, whatever happens, you know, there's some of these people are living and it's, it's ludicrous in Skegness, we have, you know, we have Grove and a road there. There's a hundred people living in 10 houses, for God's sake. Our kids deserve better than that, surely. You know, and, and, and that's why I do think that there needs to be a, there needs to be a balance, if, if you don't mind me saying. But what I would like to say, and I don't know um, if this, if, if Sarah can help us with this, would it, would it be feasible to, have a meeting for councillors or, or have a little bit of a, a training exercise just go through all this carbon thing just to just to to train us up just to just to for us laymen to get some idea of where we're at with all this you can read the reports i know but but to, to, to sit down in a room and discuss how this works and how that works would give us knowledge knowledge then to be able to help hopefully to move this forward I don't know if, if that's worth mentioning, but I, I, I just thought I'd put it to you. Thank you. I think that's a fantastic idea. And I'd say, given how important this issue is, not just to our committee, but to, I'm sure to all councillors as well, would there be any possibility of us organising a reserve members' day um, or reserve members' session 
um, and giving them the kind of presentation that Councillor Dennis is referring to. Is that something that we could do? Um, and if it is, uh, could I leave it with um, with Sarah and um, committee um, democratic services to put that together, please? Chair, if I could just interject. Um, I, I don't think it needs to be a one-off because I think it's a, it's a moving situation. And I think once we've done it in the immediate future, we also need to think maybe of a, a yearly update uh, through the uh, member state. Uh, sorry for interrupting, but I thought I'd just dive in with that idea. Thank you, Councillor Howard. Would that be possible, Sarah? Yeah, um, I'm more than happy to put something together if um, that wants to be scheduled for, for Reserve Members Day. That's not a problem. Um, it is part of the wider work programme that I've put together to introduce a carbon literacy training programme um, to the authority anyway. Um, obviously, sort of for primarily for staff, but I think for members as well, um, because I think you know, a lot of staff have said to me exactly the same thing. You know, it, it does, re you know, this requires a programme of, somebody said it earlier, of cultural change. Um, and we all need to understand uh, what the issues are and what we're talking about. So, yeah, it's definitely, that is high on the agenda. Um, and, yeah, I'm happy to put something together. Thank you very much. I have one final speaker in Councillor McNally, um, after which I would really want to wrap this up and because we have got quite a substantial um, agenda to work through, but before I bring um, Councillor McNally in, I have Simon indicating who I'll bring in first, please. Yeah, the, the, apologies, Councillor McNally. I know you've had your hand up for quite a while, so it's, it's only a very quick point. Um, we are actually at the moment having an economic viability assessment uh, carried out, which looks at the viability of providing um, affordable housing, um, which would be for the groups that Councillor Dennis has, has, has described. And as part of that brief, I have asked them to look at the viability of introducing additional costs associated with uh, providing net gain on a site, um, electronic vehicle, uh, electric vehicle charging points, and things like um, flood risk mitigation as well, where appropriate, where it's coast. So, so the viability assessment will look at the, the additional costs that will be built in and, and work out whether they are viable. It was ju just, just to make that point that that is being looked at. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor McNally. Thank you, Chairman. Just going back to the paper. The, the biodiversity mapping exercise, um, uh, just picking up really what uh, Councillor Mossop said, but I'm pretty certain, and I, but I could be wrong, that the AONB have already done one for, for, for that area. So are, are we picking theirs off and using that, or are we going to go again with that? Because I'm not sure if the AONB are actually going to do another one or, or, or what, so I don't know if it's worth sort of speaking to each other sort of thing, or I know Kay's involved with the, a lot of the stuff. Thank you. Um, Sarah? Yeah, um, so yeah, the AOMB is uh, theirs, uses the same methodology, yeah, um, so it is, it's all done by the same people. Um, so obviously our version would just be for the whole of the, the district, but yeah, it would tie in exactly with what the AOMB is working from because it's the same method. Thank you very much. I see I have no further speakers on this item. I think we've given it a good fair debate and I'm glad to see the level of accord we have between members um, on the broad thrust of this. And I would therefore formally move that we accept the recommendations at 5.1 on page 24 of our papers. Um, and I will look for a seconder, please. Councillor Makers and Sanders, I can see you waving um, at the screen. Thank you. I'll second it. Yeah, I'm wearing green, so there we are. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I will, if there's no one else wishing to speak, I will hand over to Joanne um, to conduct the voting, please. Okay, if you can just confirm whether you are for, against, or abstaining the recommendations, please. Councillor Ashton. For. Councillor Sid Dennis. For. Councillor Carleen Dickinson. For. Councillor Will Grover. For. Councillor Tony Howard. For. Councillor Thomas Kemp. For. 
Councillor Helen Matthews. Dead. Councillor Helen Matthews. Four, my four. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Councillor Makinson Sanders. Yes, four. Councillor McNally. Four. And Councillor Smith. Four. That's ten for Chairman, so that's carried. Thank you very much, Joanne. Um, that takes us neatly on to uh, agenda item five, which is East Lindsay Asset Review and Housing Development Programme update. And for this one, I'll welcome Mr. Sweeney to the meeting and um, hand over um, to you um, to present the paper, please. Okay, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I'll just say hello to everybody. Um, like Sarah, I started in April and um, my role would be to work with the new development company and as part of the council in taking um, some of its own assets forward and new land that we can bring to the table in terms of housing development. Um, I've listened to all the passionate talk about the uh, the environment and carbon reduction and, and housing developments and here I am going to have to talk about it now with the, the same amount of passion but there you go. Um, just uh, it, it, it was timely really just to to put a briefing paper together for the committee um, having been here since April and done some work on feasibility of the, uh, the council's assets and got a foothold in uh, a number of negotiations with local developers uh, on, on some coastal sites as well, so that the discussion around that was very pertinent. Um, but um, we've reached a stage now where after doing a kind of headline appraisal of the council's own land, um, we've, we've got to a stage where there's potential capacity for three to 400 properties uh, on those sites. And it was timely to take something to the exec board, which went last night, um, to, to get approval for funding for doing some more detailed fe uh, feasibility work um, and involve external consultants and designers and do due diligence checks on, on the land that we, we currently own. Now, there's a mixture of land in terms of the, their usage. Some are uh, allocated sites, some are existing car parks. So it, it's recognised that not all of those will probably come forward for housing, but there is potential on, on the majority of them in terms of their capacity. So um, the recommendation made to the exec board last night was for, to approve 250k towards uh, undertaking further feasibility work. And taking these site, uh, you know, many of these sites forward to the next stage, and possibly get them through, uh, so that we can start building housing. Now, that's against the background of when the original housing stock was transferred in '99 to, I think they were called East Lindsay Partnership Housing at the time, uh, now known as Platform. And since then, um, the council has only played a kind of proactive role, uh, a, a passive role, really, in terms of uh, enabling work, offering joint funding. Uh, offering some of its existing assets up uh, that were sold previously uh, and those, that's how development has been uh, delivered really. So the development company was set up obviously to try and contribute to housing delivery across the, uh, the district and meet some of the targets within the, the planning documentation and targets of the local, local plan. So um, the next step will be to actually, and, and most of the detail is in the briefing paper uh, included Appendix A, and there is a link to the exec report uh, that went to the board last night. Um, so most of the details in there, but there are some issues around, uh, uh, discussive issues around um, what uh, housing need in the area and what demand we address, because obviously the company was set up um, um, for commercial purposes, but it's also recognised that there, there needs to be some social input in there in influencing the delivery of affordable housing and afford other affordable products uh, to meet demand. And it's also recognised that um, there's a shortage of affordable demand, uh, 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 sorry, a a supply in the coastal areas, which are adversely affected by flood risk, uh, and also very few 106 contributions coming forward by way of affordable housing. And clearly that's a matter that needs to be addressed because on the, uh, the current housing needs, uh, there's circa 805 people, uh, uh, households in need of demand. Um, and that's almost 50% of the need across the district. So it's recognized that that has to be addressed uh, as well. 
Um, one of the other issues is around the availability of external funding and subsidy towards that provision. Um, at the moment, the programme, the existing HE programme, uh, Homes England programme, is coming to an end. Uh, I know that's been slightly extended uh, by government at the moment to, because of the effects of COVID. So, um, but there is a reliance on the key providers in the area, the likes of Longhurst and Platform, in terms of delivering affordable, because they are uh, one of the few parties that uh, third parties that have access to grant until 2024. Um, uh, as uh, strategic partners. So we are already working with Platform primarily. Longhurst has got their focus in, in Cambridge and some of the more uh, central areas where there is extensive growth. But um, we are working with Platform who um, are keen to work with us and deliver more affordable and to bring some grants to the table to help that be delivered as well. So um, the other factors that, that we're giving consideration to is the the options we've got in terms of delivery and that's included at one of the other appendices as well in the table um, about how we can work with third party partners and uh, uh, do joint funding schemes uh, or whether we do uh, uh, to play a really proactive role in terms of controlling delivery and linking back to the quality issue that was discussed earlier how we if we keep control of delivery how we can uh, control the pace of that and the quality of the properties that we are delivering as part of the housing programme. So there's all of those issues that are kind of rolled into that discussion. Um, Ten years again was another issue I thought was relevant to put in because the, the, there are a whole range of housing products we, we can deliver. Now the company obviously will be looking at the commercial benefits as well as other uh, benefits as well. But um, in terms of affordable rent products, um, we have no management skills in-house at present because of the uh, previous transfer as part of the LSVT. So clearly there will be either a reliance on third parties to, to manage those properties if we set up affordable or market rented properties to meet that demand. Uh, and clearly that there would be a fee entailed in that. So that would actually eat into any potential margins on it. Um, I should also probably mention that the company was set up to uh, as a means of intervening on sites where... Uh, these have stalled and delivery is not forthcoming and that's particularly pertinent down the coastal strip again in terms of um, sites that have, have probably obtained planning permission, made a tentative start but have stalled um, because of reasons of uh, developer margins not being sufficient and it comes back to the affordability again. Um, so uh, the idea is that the company will potentially intervene in some of those sites in recognition of the fact that they wouldn't um, uh, achieve margins of the capacity that your, your kind of more national and regional developers would uh, would achieve on those sites. So just to oh. round up really, really the, um, the, the delivery options are in there in terms of the discussion, the viability is in there, and I think the notes are in there just around, again, around house values on the coastal areas compared with some of the more inland areas where values are considerably higher. Um, build costs are fairly consistent across the patch, so gross development costs compared to values are very different uh, across the piece in terms of East Lindsay, quite clearly. Um, and uh, the, the, the briefing paper really rounds off with the, the kind of some of the less tangible benefits that might not be fully appreciated in the fact that we, we would achieve housing delivery, um, but the, the, the financial benefits from the council are that there's potential loan interest on the loan to the company, um, there's a additional council tax generated and I realise that has to support services to cover that. Um, so, excuse me, my phone's just going off. And, um, and, and also that uh, there's new homes bonus and uh, a, a reputational um, benefits as well in terms of the fact that we're contributing towards the de delivery of homes across the district. So I think, um, I think in a nutshell, I mean, the, the, the briefing paper captures the, the salient points of the exec board report last night. But obviously, if you, you wanted to refer to that in full detail, the information in full is there. Thank you very much for your report. This again feels like an opportunity where East Lindsay, if it's going, if, if, if there's an opportunity for us um, as a council, for commercial purposes to look at bringing forward housing developments, potentially those which um, wouldn't come forward um, of their own accord. Um, then we've also got an opportunity to build really nice houses, really good quality houses. And I 
have already had this conversation with Mr. Sweeney that it would be really nice if we could find enough room in what we're doing commercially to put the added a few ad, put, put the nice bits onto the houses that we're looking to build um, and where we're looking to build them so that we can take genuine pride in what we're creating um, and to take that pride as far as putting our name on the front of them like our predecessor councils used to do many years ago and take pride in the houses that they are building um, to the point that people actively want to live in a house built by East Lindsay District Council on a development brought forward by East Lindsay District Council because they know it's going to be good quality, they know it's going to look nice, they know it's going to be nicely laid out. And to if there's an opportunity here to provide some leadership in the market as well as delivering identified need um, and bringing forward sites which have, which have perhaps um, stalled somewhat. So I think there's a lot of opportunities around this um, and on that I will open it up for debate on the speakers that I have indicating which are Councillor making some sound at first followed by Councillor Howard. Uh, right, um, right. I can't get rid of this thing off my screen. Well, I, can I just say, I'm absolutely appalled that we are being told in a meeting that the, uh, there's a, a company, we haven't a clue who the uh, people that have anything to do with this company, who the staff are, who the directors are or anything, they're going to be stealing our car parts. These are community assets and we know nothing about what is going on. And I do think as councillors, we should be kept in the loop. And I just think it is poor yet again. It is poor, poor, poor communication. And that's what East Lindsay always does. And I don't think it's good enough. And Mr. Sweeney, design your estates properly or else you will get it in the neck from all of us. Um, you know, I just, I cannot tell you how angry I am to hear all of this because I listened to the executive board last night and it's all taken as read. Keep councillors informed of what is going on please it's just not good enough i read this report and quite frankly i knew nothing much more when i'd read the damn thing i really am i'm disgusted at how things are carrying on and please sort it out properly sorry i'm sorry to get cross but i think as a councillor as councillors representing ratepayers we should know what is going on i think we are a very long way between what we're discussing today and building over our car parks. I, I, I think that-, that, that <laughs> well, well, he mentioned car parks, didn't he? He said, we're looking at all our assets. How do we know which assets they're looking at? We haven't a clue, have we? Where's the input from people who know about things on the ground? Nowhere. We're all elected members. We're all equal partners in this, in this thing. I'm not particularly against building houses, but let's know what's going on, please. It's not a secret society. Thank you. Councillor Howard. I think this is almost um, more of the same. Um, I see in the paper possibilities, um, but I don't see the probabilities. I don't see, for instance, any analysis of which assets are suitable to be developed. And I immediately start to tick off ones that have got difficulties in my mind. Um, for instance, um, Tedder Hall. Um, I remember that um, it probably might be even as much as 10 years ago that a housing scheme was put forward for the building opposite Tedder Hall, as you look out the front door, the one in, in front of you there. Um, it was incredibly, I, I will say, difficult for the developer to come up with a scheme um, that, that fitted the existing building structure um, in trying to turn it into flats um, that were, that, that both fitted the existing shell and made decent homes to live in. So I, I don't see why um, Tedder Hall would be any easier uh, to do um, and the one opposite, which is obviously, um, you know, fallen by the wayside because it, it went into the too difficult box and has stayed there. Um, so there, you know, and, and Tedder Hall is, is one of the, the bigger possibilities. 
Um, then I started thinking, you know, more locally in, in, in Mablethorpe. Um, and, you know, what are we going to do? So are, are we looking at the industrial estate? Well, um, it, it's going to be a patchwork quilt um, in the sites that have just been recently let and, and the gaps in between. You, you, you couldn't uh, start building on there. That, that would just make no sense at all. Um, another asset we've got is uh, on the uh, foreshore. We've got the fairground and, and the area next to that. Well, you know, that, that's part and parcel of the, the seaside offer. Um, OK, it could be taken back from the um, leaseholder, I suppose, and um, develop for some, some very nice beachfront properties. But would it be the right place to, to do that? And, you know, again, lots and lots of questions about doing that. So then moving on, Sherwood Fields. Um, no, that's a great, you know, green amenity that we've got. And, and besides that, um, half of the fields there are, are covered by the, the, you know, the King George uh, rules and regulations. So that's just not a, a possibility whatsoever. Um, then we look at all the different car parks around town. Well, if anything, during the season, we, we're maybe lacking a little bit in car parking space rather than um, over eight during the during the summer months, uh, and I don't think there's any of those that we would we would want to lose at this this present moment in time. And if we develop with the town's funds uh, to make the place even more attractive, then probably the need for those is is going to be greater rather than than lesser. I suppose possibly Stanley Avenue, the, the um, piece of land that um, remains green down there at this moment in time. Uh, and undeveloped, uh, that might be a possibility, being as it is um, surrounded almost uh, by houses. Um, and then I think about the depot. Well, we're, we're going to want the depot for, for people to work out. I'd say that's another one that I cross up with. So, you know, everywhere I look, the things that come to mind where there is, you know, the, the possibility of delivering this uh, three to 400 new houses, um, I see more and more reason for not doing it, and that narrows down, you know, the areas where it is possible. So I think we've got to send a message back to the um, exec board and the cabinet uh, to say, yeah, okay, we've 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 set up this company, great idea, lots of possibilities, but hang on a minute, just at the moment, how is it possible? We've seen the the, 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 the there are possibilities. But how do you turn those into reality? And, and there's lots and lots and lots of questions there. Um, and I think uh, if you were to start, and I say taking the Mablethorpe examples, um, I, I think everyone that I've mentioned would meet with stiff opposition locally. And I think you've seen opposition uh, in uh, Manby um, previously. Um, local residents, um, you know, don't want. Uh, massive uh, redevelopment of their village. Um, there was um, the eco village uh, that was opposed. Um, there, uh, there was uh, again uh, against the uh, alterations to the building opposite Tedder Hall. There was resistance to all those uh, new properties coming along, and even to the fact that there was uh, opposition to a small development for. Um, gypsies and uh, travellers for a caravan site on the grounds of extra traffic um, there. Well, just imagine the extra traffic that's going to be generated by lots and lots of, of, of new properties there. So I, I, I see, I, I, I admire the exec board for um, having a, a, an out of the box moment uh, when they're thinking of putting this uh, company forward. Um, but I just see so many pitfalls uh, in taking our assets and trying to turn them into buildings. Thank you, Councillor Howard. I don't think it's any surprise that local communities are um, occasionally going to be resistant to any suggestion of any development whatsoever, whether it's this council or anyone else um, considering to bring forward an application. But at this stage, as far as I understand it, the purpose of this review is to simply find out what is and isn't possible to be achieved with the council's own assets. 
And you're absolutely right to point out that many, many of the sites that we own as a district council are very important um, community resources. And I don't think for a moment um, that any of my colleagues, um, either executive board or across the wider council, including members of this committee, um, would ever support proposals that um, effectively meant turning our, um, our, our useful car parks that market towns rely on into housing sites uh, or, or recreation fields and green spaces that have you know, demonstrable value to their local communities. Um, and in terms of when is the right time to bring this sort of thing forward, um, I mean, I'll refer, refer back to Mr. Sweeney, but we are being told about this now at the beginning of the, of, of, of the look through, at the beginning of the piece of work, um, rather than being told at the end of the piece of work that the piece of work has been done and this is what we've spotted and this is what we decided, is that right? Yeah, can, can, just can I just explain? It, it is at the very early stages, so it's only initial feasibility work to assess the assets of the council having their ownership to see if any of those could be taken forward, and obviously to do more detailed work on those to 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 make well to try and if there is a business case to be made for doing any of those sites, that's how would the the process that will be gone through. There's no hard and fast decisions being made and, and, and the, the, the report deliberately avoided going into the specifics of sites for that reason. So. Thank you very much. I have an incredibly long list of speakers. Um, Chair, so I, will, I will go to come see. back on, on the, a point. Go, um, go on, Councillor Howard. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I hear what's being said that we're at the beginning of this uh, situation. But somebody's come up with a figure of, of three to four hundred. Now, surely somebody's based that on something, not just plucked it out of the air. So, you know, some assessment must have been done, but it's not it's not in there. It's not in the report. How did they get to a three to four hundred? I say. <sighs> Sorry, I'm a little bit exasperated. Thank you, Councillor Howard. Um, Mr. Sweeney, have you can you give us an idea at where the, the the initial figure is arrived at? Yeah, sure, sure. That that that's been based on on the uh, the the area of the the sites that we've looked at, and basically on a capacity study in terms of uh, what would what would go on the site, taking account of obviously open space provision and that kind of thing, and then and then some uh, viability work in terms of. Um, what it would cost to, to develop those sites should planning permission and, and, the, uh, and the, the decisions be put in place to take them forward. So it's that initial feasibility work to explore the potential, which has got to look at issues that are included in the briefing paper around viability uh, and whether they're worth developing. That's the, the, the main body of the report does refer to it in the exec board report does refer to the need for consultation as part of that process as well. So clearly, um, it's not shirking um, the, the process of going through proper consultation. And that's why that's in there. Thank you very much. Councillor McNally. Thank you, Chairman. Well, after listening to them such positive uh, previous comments, I, um, I have had a look, but I can't remember, I can't remember if I read it sort of last night, the, the exec report, but did it say somewhere about local members being informed if, if there was something there or i can't remember if i said seen that somewhere or not can i just clarify that first mr sweeney yeah the, the, including the report there was um uh, subject to wider consultation across the council and also the need to uh, in the legal section there was the need to uh, carry out consultation before any disposal which in in all intents and purposes, it will be a disposal to the uh, company between the council and the company to take forward any development. So the, the, it, it's all it, there is a caveat in there in terms of the need for wider consultation with, across the, the council departments and, and with its members, obviously. Yeah, I, I thought I'd read it, but obviously council makers of standard had missed it. Um, as far as the maps concern, on, on the 
let, let, let's take the potential returns map. We got it. The where it says the north area forecasted return, central area forecasted return, without being picky, it's kind of hard to decipher where it changes. And I kind of feel it would have been better to have one. Is it a Venn, Venn diagram or something? Okay, yeah. Um, the, the maps were really just to show levels of achievable return. And I think it emphasizes the, the, the coastal issue because values in the coastal areas are uh, significantly less than, than in the, the areas in the center of the, the district and to some degree to the south as well. So it was really across a, a range of tenures. It was just to indicate where the variations were in the terms of achievable returns from a commercial point of view, this is obviously. Um, yeah, yeah, but what I'm saying is that I look at coastal north yeah, I wonder where it goes to North Area. Where, where's oh, I see, I see. In terms of what you mean, in terms of the patch, is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. is coastal yeah. north like nearly up to Mambi? Is central area just past Mambi? It, do you see what I mean? If it was like a, yeah, a okay. circle, you could have like a bit of a crossover point, but that, that's neither here nor there. Okay. And yeah, I ain't got a problem with anyone building anything anywhere. To be quite honest with you, the only the only worry I've got is that it's council-led, council-run. It wants to be a, a definite separate company, you know, because sometimes councils can uh, uh, take five times longer than a normal company uh, and cost about five times more as well. And it just, you know, it just, I haven't got a problem with building, I haven't got a problem with report, I haven't got a problem with anything. It's just like, you know, making sure that the costings, not on this report, but a later date uh, are, you know, in line with normal developer costings rather than excessive. That, that's all. That's for me, Chair. That's it, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor McNally. Mr. Queen, are there any points that you'd like to pick up on that? Sorry, no, um, I, I, as I say, I'd just like to emphasize it's the early stages. And I say, while, while uh, I think there's been some criticism that, it, that it's non-committal in terms of highlighting the sites that we are looking at, uh, as I say, that that was deliberately um, not excluded for any particular reason, but but it, it's really that there the needs to be a sound business case for taking any one of these sites forward in terms of housing delivery. So it was looking at the potential the capacity, the terms of viability, to see whether whether it was worthwhile pursuing any of those. But as I say, the, the main report to the exec board did specify that um, it was subject to wider consultation. Thank you, Councillor Matthew. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Andrew, for your report. We have to start somewhere, so thank you very much for that. Um, I've spent most of the pandemic delivering um, food parcels to some of the most deprived areas in Mablethorpe, Sutton on Sea, and Tresthorpe. And I can tell you there is a real need. There's like shacks behind the dunes, single skimmed buildings that I wouldn't put an animal in, that people are living in. And, you know, I think, you know, we really need to be thinking about the people in these areas and they deserve to live in quality accommodation. And what really upset me, it's not just the young people living like that, it's the older generation as well. You know, and it's it's very very sad um but things like that danny's just picked up on about it's not our speciality i think it's good that we're looking at it that we're, we want to sort of lead on it and if we can work with the making money and also dealing with the social issues that would be really good particularly on the coast where it's desperately needed um and, and just you know we do have some providers that we get a lot of feedback from um, and we just need to be very wary that whatever we do, we're delivering and supporting um, people to live in good properties. Um, and I just, you know, we've got to start somewhere and we just have to explore all, all possibilities. So, I, you know, I think this is a good, a good starting point. And as a local ward member, I would appreciate being involved at the stage that you're ready to let us be involved in. So I do pick up a bit on what Jill's saying. 
we do know our wards and you know it's good to be um informed as well so thank you very much thank you councillor matthews i'll just echo your point to say that it's important to get the right balance between what we're doing commercially and what we're doing um as a council and i think it's recognized throughout this that whilst we um whilst we're looking to um engage in activities that are going to deliver um a financial return to the council which it, we, we can then reinvest into the services that we're delivering to the people that we represent at the same time um i think there's a um that, that, that it, it's it's completely accepted that we have a duty to ensure that what we're doing commercially um is also doing something that's a genuine positive um for the people that we represent as well it's a it's a difficult balance i think sometimes to achieve um especially because we are looking to do this commercially um, rather than simply from a social aspect. But I think with the right balance, we'll get it right. And that's why we're talking about this now and at this stage, so that the concerns that members have can be fed into the process so that um, officers are aware of your concerns as well as mine. Um, and I'm sure executive board colleagues will take that on board as well. Councillor Grover. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just wanted to say something very, very quickly, and I think I'm going to have to shoot off if you've got my message. Um, I just wanted to echo your points, um, your initial points, and partially um, Councillor Makers and Sanders' points as well. We have this development company now. Obviously, no bricks have been laid down yet, but I think it's really, really important, um, an absolutely massive point that we absolutely have to lead on a standard here. You know, if, as you say, if it's going to have the East Lindsay stamp on, and it's not to the standard that we constantly go on about on this committee and have been going on about for years, then we're going to be seen as hypocrites. And actually, this is an opportunity to set a standard. And like Councillor McNally said, it's an opportunity to set a standard in a cost effective way. Because if we can't do that, you know, we're going to be judged on that. And it's just going to be an awful it's, it's not going it's not a good image for the council if we can't if we can't do that for our residents i just wanted to say that because I, I do think that it's a really really important point uh and i'm gonna have to go at that point so thank you thank you very much councillor grower i appreciate your support on those points and i've just spotted your message so thank you for your contribution this afternoon and we'll catch up again at our next meeting um councillor smith Thank you. Um, uh, I, I want to partially um, echo some of the concerns that have been um, made earlier uh, in terms of our uh, existing assets. But I, I, I was a little surprised to, to see that there was a sort of emphasis on our existing assets. Um, uh, and I hope that we are in for this development, which I think is a, a opportunity for us in terms of housing in the district to um, uh, to, to, to look beyond our existing assets and look at building elsewhere and to be a serious developer, full stop. Um, uh, historically, you know, over the last sort of 120 years, um, councils have been the key driver in their local built environments in terms of quality and in terms of uh, standards, cost, um, whether that's across the bought sector or the rented sector um with the rented sector leading the uh, uh, the rest of the the region and one of the reasons we've had such a massive decline in the quality of our housing since 1990 is because councils haven't been building their own houses so um i, I think this is absolutely an area where we could massively lead um uh, and and a return to that sort of pre-74 um uh, where we are building market housing, particularly market housing for rent. And I was really pleased to see that you had rented accommodation in here. And I, I would thoroughly support any proposal that the council do employ people with the skills to rent those houses, rather than that being subcontracted out. Um, we need our development company to not only build, but to control our rented housing, in my opinion. Um, so I, I think there's lots and lots of, of real positives in this in terms of driving not only our own development but forcing developers to follow um so um i think there's lots of opportunity although i would strike a slight note of caution in terms of trying to limit ourselves to 
um, not building in the best places, but building in the places that are convenient for us. That's not necessarily um, good design at all. Um, so, uh, so looking beyond our own assets and and really uh, looking to the future um, as a as a serious developer in the region, ongoing. Not this isn't a temporary fix. This is a real positive thing for the council. I think. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Smith. I appreciate this paper before us today um, refers to the property and assets that the council currently owns. But my understanding is that the ambition of this company, this commercial aspect. Um, is much broader and deeper. And personally, I would again support the opportunity, which I think may well exist for us as a council to bring forward and develop um, potentially some sites which have stalled in their development that have had permission for many, many years um, and simply don't stack up in terms of viability for the current um, developers. There isn't simply enough money out of it commercially, um, but at the same time, there may still be an appreciable profit um, notwithstanding our requirement to build out development to meet our um, housing delivery targets and everything else. So um, I think that ambition certainly exists within the council um, and I'm sure as that progresses any reports that are relevant or necessary will come to this committee in due course. Um, I, I agree, I, that, that was the impression that I got when this was first brought to full council um, yeah. and it's a real opportunity. Thank you. I have Councillor Makinson Sanders, Councillor Dennis, then Councillor Howard, after which I will soon want to wrap up and move on to the next item on our agenda, appreciating that time is now pressing. So Councillor Makinson Sanders. You're still muted, Councillor Makinson Sanders. Councillor McNally, I can't let you get away with that. It is not on this agenda. And I didn't have sight of last night's um, uh, executive board. I've listened to the, I've listened to it, but I didn't have sight of the um, notes. So obviously you're one ahead of me on that. Uh, Councillor Smith, um, uh, you're talking to, about the Park and Morris standards, which drove up um, the standard of housing for uh, social housing. And it would be really good if Park and Morris standards still existed today because they did, um, social housing was properly designed and it was, it was good solid housing and I think that's why we see in Louth that the houses are on places like St Bernard's Avenue sell quickly and sell well because they are they're properly built aren't they. Um, I think we need to remember that this company is going to be outside the jurisdiction of ELDC it is a standalone company so whatever you know I do think when we're coming up with all these wonderful ideas we need to be very careful because it isn't really it's going to use our assets but it is a standalone company. Um, and that worry, that does worry me a bit because um, where does our involvement actually lie? Um, who's going to do the feasibility? I do hope you're not going to use some of those people that we use um, Eastern Partnership or whatever it's called, uh, Mid East Midlands Partnership. We should be using local people to do this, local architects, use architects, don't just have the plan drawers because they're no good to us. Use people that have the, the skills and, and, um, and, and, the, and the professionalism. And um, I'm just, this is something I really do feel even more passionately about. Um, in Daventry, they have set up a, um, a building, when they set up their building company, they set up a skills division to it. And all the houses that they build take on local youths and local people to teach them the skills. So they're learning how to build brick lay, using, they're learning electrical skills, they're learning skimming, plastering, you name it. They are learning these things. And that is a huge advantage. If we're gonna have a company, we're going to upskill our young people as well whilst we're doing it. And I just think that would be a huge opportunity. And I'd hate East Lindsay or whatever this new housing lot are called of the development company to miss. And I just think it really needs to be underlined. They do it in Daventry, they do it brilliantly in Daventry and we should be copying, um, you know, uh, uh, exemplars as Mr. Leyland likes to call them. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dennis. You know, I agree with Councillor Smith 100%. This is an ideal opportunity because you, as we know in planning, you know, we cannot give away land for affordable homes. Nobody buys them. 
you can speak to Mr. Paul Edwards, he'll tell you. We, we, we struggle terrible with, with affordable homes. People just won't build them. And, you know, as a development company, the council can, can do that. You know, and, and I think that if council wants to form a company, which it has done, to be landlords, I've got no problem. For councils to form companies to go into business, I think they need to be very, very careful of what they're doing. I don't think they can run caravan parks and I don't think they can collect waste and I don't think they can do all this stuff. I think, yes, they can be landlords, but I think you need to keep a weather eye. And this is going to be a commercial company and it's going to have to make money. So I think, Councillor Malcolm Sanders, you can forget about people skimming and, and apprentices and because that's all the land of cuckoo land because that isn't going to happen because it's going to have to pay. That's going to be the problem. And I, and I know, I agree with you, I can see the look on your face now, that we should have someone involved with, but we easily might not, because we've now got a standalone company in a, in, in a different sort of uh, different sort of ball game. And but only time will tell. But, but certainly to build good quality houses, a council should do that. You know, I was all for Margaret Thatcher selling the council houses, got no problem. But what she should have done was built some more. Every one they sold, they should have built another one. Because yes, it gave people opportunities, but it also dif differentiated people who can't afford their own houses. And we've got to have council built houses and they've got to be built well. And, and we, we, we have got the, the wherewithals as a council to do that. And we should absolutely 100% behind Councillor Smith. We should be straight in there and you Councillor Mason Sanders and have those in place. So they're absolutely quality homes. And if you build quality council homes, the private sector will have to follow that. They will have to follow because one will go against the other. So I think you know. But, but as I say, I'm not all I'm not all together totally consumed by council being in business much. But anyway, that's down to you, lot. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Dennis. Excuse I'm... me, Chair. Excuse me, Chair. It's Councillor Dickinson. I just need to go and get my son from school, and then I'll go. I'll come back. But I'll turn my video off while I'm gone. Thank you Rather very than much. Rather than leave the meeting, I'll leave, I'll leave it on, but turn the video so you know I've left and then I'll, um, Joanne, you'll watch out for me. I'll be about 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm sure we'll still be going. Um, I, I was about to say that I'm sure Mr Sweeney is taking on board the comments that uh, elected members are making in respect of what kind of houses um, they would really like to see this company delivering. And I'm sure executive board colleagues um, will be left in no doubt as well, because I shall certainly make sure that they know. Um, I have one final speaker on this item, which is Councillor Howard, after which um, I'd like to wrap it up, please. Yeah, just very quickly, I, um, and it kind of follows neatly again um, from what Councillor Dennis was saying. Um, in the um, paragraph six, the delivery options, um, I think the, the, the favoured one is the mixed approach, um, which means that we can do whatever we want that is appropriate uh, in the location. Uh, I do think um, you know, that it is a great opportunity uh, for us to um, you know, uh, mend history um, because as I said, when we uh, saw houses taken out of the uh, rented sector, they weren't the council houses weren't replaced. Big mistake. Uh, we've never recovered from that. But uh, as long as we keep, um, you know, the option of having a mixed approach, then we can do all the appropriate actions that uh, the company sees fit. Thank you, Councillor Howard. Um, I would say thank you very much, Mr. Sweeney, um, for the report and presentation that you've um, given to us today and answering the questions of elected members. Um, is there anything that you'd like to add uh, before I take this to the vote, please? Um, yeah, just, just thank you, Chairman. Just two points, really. One, um, uh, the discussion around bringing additional development and not just only looking at our, the council's assets, that's already underway. We're in discussions with um, other third parties, uh, developers, um, the local RPs as well. And um, we're looking to, we're already looking at two schemes um, that we're trying to uh, uh, fire up again, really, in terms of the fact that the, the, the sites are currently dormant. And obviously, details of those will be brought forward in time in a separate report. But um, um, secondly, on the issue of quality, 
um, that, that one of the main purposes of looking at our own assets for development was the fact that we'd have some control if we did take any of them forward over the pace of delivery and of the quality as well. Obviously, reliance on third parties delivering properties and, and, and developments for us, um, it does limit our, uh, the, the extent of our control over quality. So cl clearly, we are trying to address as part of taking the programme forward the issues that have been discussed as part of this afternoon's discussions, really. So, yeah. Thank you very much. I will just take advice from um, Anne or Joanne. This item is for the recommendation is that we note the report and recommendations to the executive board um, last night. Do we need to take a vote on this or are we just, are we content to accept that we have noted it? Um, Joanne? Uh, yeah, I think if we just want to take a vote that we've noted the recommendations, yeah, please. Thank you, in, in which case I will move that formally um, and look for a second. Someone please- I'll that. second that, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Dennis, and I'll hand back over to Joanne for the vote. Okay, if you can please just confirm whether you are for or against or abstaining the recommendations. Councillor Ashton. For. Councillor Sid Dennis. For. Councillor Howard. For. Councillor Thomas Kemp. For. Councillor Helen Matthews. Four. Councillor Makinson Sanders. I think you're on mute, Councillor. On mute. I can only see forward steps. Where are the recommendations? Because I can't see any. So, page, oh, sorry. Top, of, top of page 26. Top of page recommendation 26. that the committee notes the report and recommendations made to well, the I, 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 um, I note the report. I don't necessarily agree with it, but I'll, re I'll note it. Okay. Councillor McNally. Four. And Councillor Smith. Four. That's eight for chairman, so that's carried. Thank you very much. I'll move on to item six, which is the five year housing supply and housing delivery test update um, and hand over to Simon who will present this item. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm conscious time sticking on, so I'll keep it very brief. It's a, it's a fairly mundane item compared to the other anyway. Um, I think most of you will probably be aware of the five-year housing supply figure and the housing delivery test figure. These are something that we have to actually calculate on an annual basis. The five-year housing supply figure is something that we calculate as a council and the housing delivery test figure is produced by central government and it's a benchmark across the entire country. Every single authority has a housing delivery test uh, calculation result. Uh, I'll just briefly go through both of them. Um, the five-year housing supply, that looks at whether we have enough deliverable sites to accommodate our need over the next five years. So these sites have to be deliverable. Um, we have to have a planning commission in place and we have to have a reasonable idea that they're going to come forward within that five years. Obviously, it's, it's impossible to tell for certain whether a developer is actually going to build these houses. But we do try and discuss with the developers to, to find out their intentions and obviously sites that are already underway, it's fairly obvious that they're coming forwards. So as I say, we, we have to demonstrate that we have a five year supply, we keep a record of these and assess it uh, throughout the year and provide this calculation at the end of the year. And currently we have 5.92 years supply. So that's, that's above the five year supply. Uh, it doesn't sound like much, but that is actually a comfortable margin above the, the five years. In terms of the housing delivery test, this looks at actual delivery of housing on the ground, so how many are actually built. This is taken over a three year period, so it's an average of those three years, and it's actually one year in arrears. Um, so the figure you're looking at is effectively from uh, 2017 through to 2019, 2016 through to 2019, sorry. Um, as you can see from the report there, uh, we are actually at 109%. Uh, the pass rate is 95%. So again, we're, we're comfortably above that pass rate. 
it's important that we do stay above that pass rate. As you can see from the graphic there, if we drop below, there are different measures that are put in place. Uh, things like an action plan um, to sort of work out what we're going to do to try and address that delivery. And if you drop below 75%, we move into worst case scenario territory. Uh, and that's where the tilted balance when making planning decisions changes. And when we have proposals for housing in front of us, um, we're in a position where we have to actually show that there is demonstrable harm if we wanted to refuse it. So it, it, puts, oh, councils, it, it puts councils in a position where because they really need housing, they have to approve things that perhaps otherwise they would look to refuse because of a, a lower quality design, for example. So it's important we stay above that. And as, as, as I've said, uh, we're, we're above the five year supply and we're also nicely above the, the housing delivery test threshold as well. I've included in there just an idea of how our neighbours are doing as well. Uh, as you can see, it's a little bit of a mixed bag. Um, some of them performing sort of very well um, and above us, but some of them considerably below us as well. So it just gives you a flavour of, of where we're at with those. There's not much more to say on that, but I'm happy to, to answer any questions that, that you might have. Uh, the recommendation is fairly straightforward and just to, to continue to, to monitor this uh, and keep an eye on it. And obviously, if necessary, come back to, 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 to committee if we need to put measures in place to try and address it, if it looks like we're, we're struggling with these figures. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Simon. It's worth pointing out that I think this year, this is a um, really encouraging score for East Lindsay. It's substantially better than it was last year. Um, I would say that it would still, it, it still appears that our delivery is a little bit sluggish compared to some of the other councils around Lincolnshire, which I remember from these same figures last year were about the same rate ahead of us as they are this year. Um, it's just the um, end result for each of us is slightly different. Um, but at the same time, to score 109% this year or over, the, um, over the current period um, is pretty good. Um, I just hope that uh, obvious COVID stuff this year doesn't uh, doesn't knock it badly next uh, 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 for the next time we come to report this next year. Uh, but saying that, if it does for us, I mean it will for the rest of our neighbours as well. Um, I have Councillor Howard, Councillor Mason, Simon, you've just indicated. Would you like to come back? And only, only very quickly, Chairman, on, on that point. I think that the fact that um, it's a three year average uh, will help to sort of normalise and, and iron out any sort of dip that there is this year. Obviously, if it's a prolonged dip, that's that's slightly different, but it does help to sort of average that out a little bit. Yep, good point and thank you. Um, Councillor Howard, then Councillor Mason from Sanders. Yeah, the figures um, are quite comforting because it's something that in the past we've, we've struggled with this uh, calculation. However, there are, there's a couple of holes in the report and I'm, I'm, I just uh, want to highlight those. Uh, paragraph 3.2, uh, it concludes this effectively and then finishes. So I don't know what it effectively does, and I'd like to know. Um, and then when it goes on to the appendix, um, I've got some difficulty with the calculations being made. Um, on page 52, box five, it tells us that they've taken the information from boxes one and four above the calculation of the supply is X over Y times 100. Well, I've taken the figures there um, of uh, 3777 over 3609 as opposed to 3389 over 3125, as is stated in the, in the report. Um, and that comes out at the, the 5.23 uh, position, uh, which is then the which is actually the calculation in box five on page 54. So I just wonder how I get different figures to use um, from the, the, my reading of the report uh, to what's actually in that box five. Now, um, either the figures at X and Y that I picked up on are wrong or the figures put into the calculation are wrong. 
it, 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 the report does not make sense as it, as it reads now. So those are the two holes in the report that I, I just want clarification on. But as I say, overall, the situation does seem improved on, on what I've seen in the, the lifetime I've been on this, uh, on this committee. Thank you, Councillor Howard. Um, Simon. Uh, just looking at the, the boxes, um, you, you'll have to talk me through the figures again um, and what you've got, but just, just in case it's, it, it helps or if it makes a difference, there are two different calculations on there. One is for the 5% buffer and one is for the 20% yeah. buffer. Yeah, I'm talking about the first one. First one, right, 5% yeah. buffer, yeah. Which is at the bottom of page 52 if you've got the report there. Uh, so 5.92 years, that one. Yeah. yeah. The figures you've used there are 3389 and 3125 to make the 118%. Yeah. By three, one, if you see in box five. Yep. Yeah. Okay, but the introduction says you're taking X and Y. Well, X in box four above is 3777 not 3389. Are you with me? Yes. Three. And then you, you go back um, over the page to get your Y figure in box one on page 51, which is 3609 and not 3125, as quoted in box five. So I, I, I say. Just, just bear with me, Baron. There's a disparity. You, you, you quoted that it's X over Y, but the figures at X and Y are not the ones quoted in the calculation. Yeah, yeah, you're correct. Hang on. Um. You see, I would, I would make that at, um, you know, the hundred and five percent, the same as it says in the twenty-year figures. So I, I'm. I'm confused. No, 20% figures, right? I um, must admit, I'm confused now as well as to what's happened. Perhaps you could um, answer that in, a, in an email to us. At a, a I think I'll have, to, I'll have to, yeah, rather than trying to, trying to sit here and calculate it and work it out again um, here, I'll have to uh, do an update to all committee members on that one. Apologies. I think so. Could I say, I, I, I find it difficult to accept the report as there's, you know, the, the calculations don't don't make sense to me. Now, you may have a reason for it, but um, it, I can't see it clearly in the report. No, I, I, absolutely. I, I totally understand that. I'll, I'll do an email update uh, to, to, to everyone. And if uh, I'll discuss with, uh, with with Councillor Ashton, if we feel it's necessary to bring it back to, to a later committee as well, I'll, I'll do that too. Yeah, yeah. No, thank you very much, Simon. My apologies. Thank you very much, Councillor Howell. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, I'm sure we'll get to the bottom of that and to the satisfaction of members um, promptly. Um, uh, Councillor Mason Sanders. I was getting all excited because I thought that we'd be able to turn some applications down um, if we got an oversupply. So I, I, I do hope we get some figures that are still on the right side of it all. Um, because that's something that um, the supply we only ever seem to get big developers because they tick lots of boxes those aren't and i i would like to see more small builders around here have the opportunity to build houses but we seem to be you know it's all big stuff all the time and i was rather hoping that these figures would actually stop us having to have these ghastly big estates in louth which really aren't adding anything to our communities whatsoever so many people are moving up here and I think we've been told that COVID is driving them up to Lincolnshire. Um, our sense of community is, is fast being eroded really. And I, and I really feel for the coast because I think it's important that we ought to be able to 
build on the coast and it does take the pressure off the market towns so I, I do hope your figures come out on the right side of five because I would like to see quite a lot of it stopped and lots of little infills that local builders can do and local builders I think do a better job at the end of the day so um, it, it, it's an interesting read um, so I hope I'm reassured thank you Thank you. I'll bring Paul Edward in, who will, I think, address some of the issues that you've just raised, Councillor. Paul. Yes, thank you, Chairman, Committee. Good afternoon. Um, just really a, a clarification, really, on the purpose of the five-year supply and why we have to have a five-year supply. And, of course, Committee will know that it's not a, it's not a maxima. If you have a five-year supply of housing with or without your buffer, it doesn't mean that you can refuse everything after that. You still have to keep a five-year supply and you still have to look at the merits of applications um, as they come in. In terms of large housing sites, of course, the bulk of our housing commitment, if you look across the allocations across the recently adopted local plan, there are some very large sites which are um, very important in terms of giving us our five-year supply and our ongoing commitment. So I, I, I'm sorry that if we have a five-year supply, it doesn't mean you can approve, you can refuse other sites. And th the fact that some of them are large is a consequence of having to always meet our housing need and make allocations on sites that then go through consultation, become a part of the adopted local plan, and therefore they give... Uh, applicants and developers and the local housing builders who've got a good record in the district that they know they can come forward onto a site with a certain amount of confidence. I hope that helps, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Councillor McNally. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, the, on, on box two, page 52, coastal dwelling commitments is 819, and I can't... I, I, I've tried downloading the local plan while it's what I've been on, but wasn't the coastal commitments about 1,200 when the local plan was produced? I'd be quite interested to know what what sort of how many have been built out, you know, because if it was 1,200, it's sort of nearly 25 percent that's been built. Thank you, Simon. You don't have to come back now. You come back later if you want. <laughs> I, I can I can answer that one. Uh, the the position statement looks at deliverable sites. Um, so in terms of uh, commitments, if a site, for example, has been dormant for a number of years, we would remove it as a commitment. Um, the chances of it actually coming forward, if, there are some sites that have had permission that, are, that had permission 20, even 30 years ago. Um, so it's very difficult to leave those as a commitment. So we, we go through on a regular basis and look at what can realistically be left in um, and, 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 and sites that are that old. It, it's very hard to call it a commitment, really, um, because if it's not been brought forward in 30 years, 20 years, even 10 years, chances are it's not going to come forwards. Um, so, so that's why that figure will alter over time. Um, and so we, we haven't had any new approvals or very few new approvals, but others have got older and older and older, and that's gradually that, that sort of reduces. We, we, we would get we would get pulled up if we had sites in there as a commitment that were given permission 30 years ago, and the inspector would say, Well, what if it's not come forward in 30 years? How, how, how do you think it's going to come forward in the next year or the next few years? And um, so that's why that figure will, will be different. That, that, has, that has reduced. Okay. Can I just come back on that? Because I'm sorry. That's on um, that's box two. That's coastal dwelling commitments, the, the eight one nine. But then we've got deliverability is four fifty. So, would you talk about the deliverable ones? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So no, a commit. The commitment is a site that has planning permission. Um, and that, that, that may come forwards in the future. The deliverable, the, the, the five-year supply is based on ones that we know are going to come forwards in the next five years, or we're very sure we've got a good idea are going to come forwards in the next five years. So the, the commitments and deliverables, are, uh, the five-year supply houses are slightly different. There, there'll be commitments that we don't know whether they're going to come forwards within that five years, but they, they still count as a commitment. There's still an extant permission that someone could actually build. Um, and if that's what I'm trying to get to because I'm sure the extant permissions were about 12 or 1100 or something on the coast. 
I think I think that the time the local plan was done, um, I think it was. I think in the local plan, just say something like 1,200. Yeah, you're right. Um, so that, I'd just be interested to know if, that, if, if out of that 1,200, you know, if we had 400 houses built within the coast, if we're saying that the coastal dwelling commitment is now 800, where's then 400 gone? Okay, so we, we, we have, right, so so that, that 1,200, um, I don't know the exact dates, but bearing in mind that the local plan's now been adopted for nearly two years, and those figures would have predated that. If, if there will have been, there are some houses that have been built through that time. So let's say around 60 or 70 houses a year are built in the coast. So you're looking at 210 dwellings, at least instantly there that, that will be removed because they've been built now. So they'll, they'll fall off that straight away. Um, with them, you have to go through and have a look and, and, man, and keep up. The, the position statement is a huge document and we go through on a regular basis and look at what sites, although they've got permission, are they still likely to come forward? And as I say, as they get older and older and older, there's far less chance of that site coming forwards in the future. So, so we remove those. They still have permission. A site that was a site that has permission and was started 30 years ago, someone yeah. could pick up a spade tomorrow and start building on it. The chances of that happening after 30 years are incredibly slim. So that's why we, we remove it from the figures because you can't you can't say that it's got any realistic proposition of being built at the moment. So, yeah, I mean, we've got, I think there was, there was one in this village here for, I think it's 30 houses back from 50 years ago or so, yeah. and it's just, it's just not going to happen. But on, on the yeah. coastal, so, so, on the ones that have been, I mean, just on a different thing, but on the ones that have been built, let's say 60 have been built, do you identify, I'm going back to an earlier report, would Andrew take that sort of information to see actually there's been houses built quite substantially in that area of the coast actually if we've got any land in that area of the coast as well so you can see you can pick up the profitability so to speak there, there, there has there has been some discussion um i've had some discussion with andrew and through tim about um these sites that have been stalled for a long period of time are those sites that are potentially suitable for the council's uh, company to, to bring forwards um, so if, if it's a site that a developer wants his 20% margin on but can't bring it forwards at that price, can the council actually bring it forwards at a lot lower margin? Um, so, so Andrew is looking at those sites um, and looking at what sites there are, where they are, what's been delivered. So he, he is looking at all of that as well. Um, he, did, he, he did mention that towards the end that it's, it's not just council assets the company will look at. In the future, it will look at other sites as well and, and, and whether there's opportunities to bring those forwards that have stalled. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I don't have any further speakers. The recommendation on this one, um, I don't think um, requires a vote. I'll just check that with um, Joanne. The recommendations at, um, at 6.1 and 6.2 on page 49. Um, essentially, it's a case that um, ongoing monitoring of, um, will be carried out. Um, and in terms of the housing delivery test, it's based on delivery and the above mentioned will um, affect the result of the test. So effectively, we've received the report and, and unless I stand corrected, we don't actually need to vote on it. That's correct. Yes, Jim. Thank you. Um, agenda item seven, local development orders and up. Um, Councilor Mason, it sounds like you're indicating to speak. No, no, I'll, I'll wait on that one. I was, I was going to just bring something up I've just seen on the planning portal that just change about changing the class orders. And I thought we got to the end of the end of the agenda, and we haven't had way. I'll bring it up at the end of the agenda. I'm naughty. Thank you. Sorry. Um, yeah, I, item seven: local development orders. An update from Paul Edward, please. Ch Chairman, excuse me, could I just advise that I think Councillor Matthews has dropped out of the meeting. I was just trying to find out if, um, I think it was just as I came back in, she went, but she's not there. I've just found her found mobile, but I'm not getting an answer, but I don't think she's on our screen anymore. We have a chat from um, Councillor Matthews saying that she has to leave. Um, that's that fine then, that's fine. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Carry on, Paul. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Good afternoon. Um, I will be brief. Um, 
this is very much a, an updating report about local development orders following the committee's discussions and your minutes from your last meeting and it would be um, out of out of order for us to not have a meeting that doesn't talk about a local development order for a change. Um, so in terms of the update chair, um, obviously we talk about local development orders just to tell you what they are on paragraph 1.3 of the report at page 56. But, but in terms of an update, I can be very brief. The Fantasy Island Local Development Order, you know, was agreed unanimously by the Executive Board last night. Um, we're hoping that we can get that sealed as a legal document Thursday next week, so it will hopefully be formally adopted under the terms of the delegation from next Thursday. And then the coastal LDO, uh, Chair, you're obviously um, a party to the first reference group meeting last week, I believe it was. And my understanding is we are hoping to get that to executive board in September so that um, the process can then be uh, formally started. Um, so that's the, the update, Chair. Unless there's any questions from committee, that's really all I was wanting to say. Thank you very much. Um, no, I'll simply uh, thank you very much for that update, Paul, and, 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 and just say that, yes, this paper went through um, Executive Board. The, the Fantasy Island LDO paper went through the Executive Board last night, um, having been out to consultation um, actually until midnight last night um, with no other impediment um, at the Executive Board other than uh, me completely losing my train of thought when it came to presenting it. Um, I will simply say that I appreciate that some of our strategic partners um, have raised concerns uh, about our local development orders, both the Fantasy Island one and the coastal LDO uh, that we discussed at our last uh, planning policy committee meeting. Um, I think there's some um, element of confusion um, between the two that uh, some of the responses to the uh, Fantasy Island local development order that was discussed last night um, picked up elements that are more relevant to the coastal LDO that's at a much earlier sort of stage in its development and is still being worked up. Um, but I will hand over to members of the committee if you'd like, um, so I've got speakers indicating that they would like to come in. I have Council Makers and Sounders first. Oops, Daisy. Thank you. Um, can you have a section 106 attached to one of these or orders? Can you hear me? I can yes, hear you. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, in theory, a, a, a planning obligation 106 isn't um, just tied to a planning application or a planning approval. Uh, an owner of land can enter into anything with the local planning authority if it's related to the development plan and it's reasonable and, and, and not excessive. So in, in principle, you can, yes, there's nothing to, there's nothing to prevent you. Because I, I was asking this because when this came up at the leaders meeting, I did point out, I was, I used to be the representative when they had Lincolnshire Health. I used to go to all their meetings and there's always been a concern about the health services along the coastal strip. And um, with winter pressures and everything, if you're gonna have people staying in caravans for longer, that will add to the pressures on the um, on, on, on the health service that our residents enjoy. And I just wanted to see if there was any way that um, big developers can be asked to contribute towards um, the health services that are being provided um, along the coast. So um, I know it sounds a bit, I was told that was political. I don't think it's political. I want to stand up for our residents who already uh, are already upset about the um, the struggle that they have to actually get into to see doctors and things in the summer so if you're going to extend the season i, I would have thought the section 106 um agreement to put some more money into our health service wouldn't have been a bad idea i think chairman that's a matter for the local plan and the review of the plan because of course when a, a local development order is issued it's issued by this planning authority and it's a, 
a unilateral document and therefore no one else is a party to it and no one else can be um, held by any terms in it. So it's very much really a matter for the re review of the plan and what we know members feel about the ability for development on the coast. And that's where the, the infrastructure plan that again was reported to your last meeting, that's, that's, the role of, that's the role of that infrastructure delivery plan. Thank you. And I, I would just emphasize that the three planks of what we're pursuing to try and um, revive and stimulate and encourage the economy on the coast and the tourism industry that we've got is actually quite modest. And what we're looking to do with the coastal LDO, um, with the planning permissions that have been submitted by um, park owners and operators that are looking to level up their planning conditions where they've got um, different occupancy conditions across different parts of their site and indeed with the Fantasy Island local development order which included um, in the zone one element of that a season extension of just over 30 days um, to taking Christmas and New Year for people that are coming to that site and, 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 and enjoying that attraction. It's quite limited numbers, um, simply because of the nature of, 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 um, of winter, um, the capacity of uh, car older caravans and lodges, then if, if, if they cannot physically um, cope with being occupied during the winter, then they won't be because they'll be frozen yeah. pipes, they'll be burst. Mm -hmm. so I think this, this is limited in its nature by the owners and operators that are able to operate in the winter months and also the um, desire of people to come and stop here. And people may want to spend a period of time, I think, realistically over Christmas and possibly um, at New Year. But I, I, I think there is a natural limit to the number um, and therefore the risk that I think Councillor Macon and Sanders is pointing out. And at the same time, any risk that exists in terms of flood risk and impact on local amenities and everything else. Because in terms of the number of, of, of caravans that we have on the Lincolnshire coast, the number of visitors that we know come and enjoy in the summer, the number that we're talking about um, on both the um, coastal LDO um, and the Fantasy Island LDO and everything else is pretty slight compared. It's not a case of opening the floodgate. Um, well, as long as it's not. <laughs> uh, Howard. I want to deal with it, the, the two LDOs completely separately because I've been heavily involved with the, the coastal one. Uh, and can I say that getting the reference group together, uh, I think has been a great success. Um, it was very interesting to take part in that. Um, and uh, from uh, members all along the coast, there was a variety of views as to how they could use uh, an LDO. Um, and I think the, the overall message was they wanted flexibility. They didn't particularly want something uh, that was a one size fits all. They wanted the opportunity to have the ability to develop their business uh, through the off season in a way that they wanted. You know, uh, they didn't want to be open all the time. They didn't want to have people there uh, 12 months of the, the year. But they saw that there were opportunities uh, to improve their business uh, if they were able to, uh, and different people thought of it in different ways that they would take advantage of it. Um, and I thought that, that that was very, very positive. The Fantasy Island um, LDO does worry me just a little bit um, because I believe that there is opposition from local people from the local parish council and also the local district councillor uh, to this particular one. And my gut feeling is that we're actually favouring one particular business operator 
uh, in the coastal area above all the others and giving them a slight advantage. Um, and I'm just wondering whether we, we are making a rod for our own back that other people will come and say, I want my you know, own way of getting out of planning regulations. It, it's just a nagging gut feeling that I've got that there is some opposition there and it doesn't, we don't seem to be sending out the right message that because we, we are prepared to put one business's interest above all others along the coast. I'd, I'd be interested for, for comments from officers on that. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll let Paul um, pick up on the uh, gestation uh, process for the Fantasy Island um, LDO, but what I would say is that this is something that was initiated by the owners of that site, and it's not an unusual thing for a major attraction or um, something like Fantasy Island to want to bring forward and want to do. Looking at, if you look on the uh, District Council planning, um, planning history, there are 110 separate applications that are listed for the Fantasy Island site um, on there. And this effectively looks to give permitted development for exactly the same kind of uses which each of those separate three zones already have permission for. It's effectively giving permitted development to shuffle it around and to change it around. And I appreciate, and we, we did take on board the concerns that have been flagged up by uh, the, the objections that have been flagged up by people living locally, by the local ward member um, and others. Um, but at the end of the day, it comes down to a balance and there's still the requirement that whatever happens on that site cannot create a nuisance or cause a nuisance. Our colleagues in environmental health have the powers um, that they need to make sure that, 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 that a nuisance isn't created and isn't permitted. Um, and in no, terms I, of, I, I, it's, I, it's I fully appreciate we've, we've got licensing, we've got environmental health and, and things like that. Um, uh, it, it still doesn't just quite, I, 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 it just doesn't in, sit with in, me. And I, I, it's just a gut, I say it's a gut feeling that we, we may be, you know, we certainly should be supporting a, a very go ahead local business. There, there's absolutely no doubt that over the last 10, 15 years, the de development down there are, are bringing forward a world-class, I, I, I do mean world-class um, facility there. Uh, they've, they've done it and they've done it at a pace and, and, and it's great to see. Um, and no doubt the, the customers that flock there believe that it's a, a, a great attraction. Um, I, I just don't, well, it just doesn't fit right that this is the way that we should be supporting them. I think we can support them without this. If it gives any additional reassurance that we're um, to the point that we may be favouring one operator, one developer over potentially others, um, I am fairly certain that we would look, we would be prepared to look and assist where possible if there are other operators, other developers that um, would like to explore with us the um, possibility of local development order, then I'm sure that's something which Paul and the team would be prepared to pick up and look at and help with if that's something that we can do. It's not something that we can do on every site. Um, but no. and, and that's why, why I'm very happy with the, the coastal one, because it's, it's business wide. It's not focused on one particular attraction, it's business wide. And I, and I think that's the right thing for a council to get involved with, something that uh, helps everybody across a, a particular sector. Um, and I just, I just not sure that we should be focusing on one particular um, attraction. I will, I will hand over to Paul because I'm sure I, m I'm aware that there are other sites that are already operating with their own LDOs um, before we get to the Fantasy Island one. So it's not exclusive for Fantasy Island. There are others that have been done on other sites, but I'll hand over to Paul who knows the details of that better than I do. 
Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, we heard last night about the existing LDO that exists for bus Butlins, and I do know in my discussions with Fantasy Island that they shared their master plan with us. I think it's dated 2012, so we've been in discussions for many years, and we've certainly been talking to them uh, about this LDO for probably 12 months. And of course, as you say, Chair, um, all operators and landowners are able to come to us with proposals and we then have to go through the consultation process. Um, but, but, but I think in terms of, obviously, a, a decision was made last night and we can't look to unravel or change that. Um, the, the, the LDO has, for, for want of sealing it, now been adopted. Um, but I do understand that. And as you say, Chair, uh, if any other operators you know, had thoughts that they had a site large enough, which had enough variety in it to benefit from an LDO, then, of course, we are pragmatic, open and flexible always to new ideas and innovations. And, of course, uh, an LDO on the coast is potentially an innovation which hopefully uh, will be received very well. Thank you very much, Paul. Councillor Dennis. Thank you, Chairman. Just to talk about Fantasy Island, yeah, I, I, and I would agree with Paul. Um, we were talking to Fantasy Island three or four years ago over this, so it's not something that's fairly instantaneous. Um, I do see where Tony's coming from. He's a very pragmatic man who thinks it through. But also, if you look at Fantasy Islands as a multi-million pound company, you know, they need to look at putting vast amount of, in, uh, of investment of infrastructure in, and they need some sort of guarantee that that can be moved through unimpinged by planning, you know, every time, excuse me, get rid of him. Um, it, 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 it depends, you know, you've got to look at the, you've got to look at the picture and see, you know, pragmatically that they're putting, if they're going to put mass investments, if they're going to build hotels or whatever they're going to do, that, that you know, they, they're going to do it. To be open in the winter time, it's not going to put any infrastructure. I, I am surprised that the, that the opposition member, if, if I think it's the opposition member I'm thinking, who's portfolio holder for, for development uh, on the coast, seems to want to be such against this, this, um, this, 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 this thing we've got down with Fantasy Island. If I can get on to um, the caravan parks, I think we need to let the markets decide with holiday units. I think if we have a, a, a blanket for everybody to open right across the parks, you know, we could have somebody living in a, in a not for fit for purpose uh, unit who could really hurt themselves and, you know, with it not be very warm in there, it'd be very, very cold. And, uh, you, you know, and somebody dies of hypothermia, I think the storm we could get from that would, would be would, would, would be absolutely horrendous. I think we need to allow appropriate units with hard standing that's winterized, you know. And in fact, we spoke on the bid, we were spoken to Tim Leaders this morning, the bid got together for a reprise, and an idea came up with that the caravan parks that want to stop open should get in touch with the council and should and then be and then be vetted that they have got fit for purpose units, that they have got car parking, they have got a robust, a, a robust um, evacuation plan. Because, you know, at the meeting on Monday, I wasn't invited, but they tell me at the Monday, you know, the county council and the environmental agency said very little, which I always think when they don't say, oh, it's not very helpful. And, and if, if, we, if, we, if we're not very careful, you know, we're, we're going to, we're going to get us in a position where we need we can't do with three winters. We can't do with the winter. We can't do with the summer this winter. This winter, you know, we're, we're trying to help now. You know, we're very busy. I can tell you if I'm getting more busy, that I know people, are, we're opening up now slowly and surely and in the new normal, whatever that is. I'm assuming we're back to the old normal, I'm sure. But that's the difficulty we've got. And, and, and the difficulty we've got, we, 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 if we give everything too much, we're going we're gonna to win the battle and lose the war. If, if that makes any sense. We need to be pragmatic and we need to protect our staff and we need to protect our residents and we need to protect our visitors. So it's a three-pronged thing. We've got to protect people. You know, it's not just, it's not just, um, you know, I've made notes, you see, which is unusual for me. I don't usually make notes. But 
Uh, oh, oh, to pick up on something about the, the medical thing, about, about the uh, 106 agreements, uh, Jill, a lot of planning permissions come in for these big housing estates, and nobody asks for 106 agreements off, 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 the, off, the, off the health service. They don't ask for it. You know, the, the developers don't ask for it. And, 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 and the, you know, you see, oh, the local medical practice was asked, didn't want anything. The NHS don't want anything. Paul will confirm that. They, they, don't, they don't want any, any monies. I don't believe that there is a waiting times or any difference in a summer than in a winter. Because I believe I'm chairman of the PPG at Beacon Medical Practice. And the major problem is they've got five people trying to do 12 people's jobs. They haven't got the GPs, they can't get the staff, and that goes right across the board. So, you know, that bit blows that out of the winter. Only, you know, by only allowing units that are suitable for winter application, but double glazing, central heating, and winter isolation, there will be a positive PR, there will be a positive from that. And it's the same with private buildings. If you want to get private buildings to be winterized, they don't want to just put them in. If, if you want to bring people in that use places in the winter, that wants to be, win they need to be winterized. They need to be brought up to winter standard, which is, which is another, we're moving forward. That's another way to move forward as well as, as, well as be open. You know, we, know, we need to be open for business, but we need to be open for business in a mindful fashion. I've also, um, I've just had, a, I've had an email from the, I'm chairman of the Skegness D bid for the, it's not Skegness, for the coastal bid for all our levy payers. And I've had an email off, off, off the bid manager, Nicola. I understand there's a policy meeting this afternoon where you will be attending. Would you mind please asking this question of which is, could the local group confirm if considerations have been made to relax planning permissions during the winter months and alongside the pen potential implementation of a coastal local development order, will street traders and business owners have an opportunity to take advantage of this to enable them to perhaps, for example, put seated areas outside their businesses and in car parks and wherever possible due to social distancing. And that's, uh, <gasps> I will now pause for breath and let you get on with it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Dennis. Paul. Um, I just think it's worth um, that the committee may be aware that the business and planning bill that is going its way through the committee stages in Parliament um, has attracted the attention of the Lords because there are amendments that have been made to the bill which will give a 14-day consent period for caravan owners and operators to extend their season. So the, the present process, which committee will be aware of through the Section 73 process, if these amendments um, get into the Act, then there will be a much accelerated 14-day process for operators to vary the terms of their occupancy. So whether it will make the coastal LDO unnecessary, I don't know. But of course, we're watching that very closely. I think it's due for, for debate in its second reading next week sometime. Um, I, I just thought it would be useful to let committee aware of that because now obviously the Lords are um, looking at specific issues like extending the season, which I think I'm correct in saying is a term that came from this authority. Thank you very much, Paul. I don't have anyone else indicating to speak. I'm sure the um, points that uh, Councillor Dennis raised um, via the bid, we can pick those up um, and see what we can do with those. Um, I don't have any further speakers, so I'll wrap this debate up. I think we've had a good discussion on it and it follows on from a thorough discussion that we had at our last planning policy committee meeting. Um, in June. So thank you very much for that. The next item is date and time of the next meeting, which is currently programmed for Thursday the 17th of September. So I look forward to seeing you all there. I will thank um, all of our contributors this afternoon. Um, it was very remiss of me actually. I realize after agenda item four i didn't specifically thank um sarah baker for um her input into that and answering members questions 
and I would formally just record that now. Um, it was an incredibly good report, in, uh, very detailed, good presentation and good answers to all of our questions. Um, so thank you very much and thank you to members, um, council makers and founders. Thank you for um, your input today. Um, I, note, I, bet, yeah. <laughs> I note that Councillor Mossop um, has left the meeting um, a little while ago, but offered his thanks for being allowed to participate. Um, so simply There's a, a beast in the ditch, in the canal, and he's had to go and try and find out whose beast it is and see if it's still alive to try and get it out again. Well, in which case, <laughs> our thoughts are with Councillor Markup in, 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 <laughs> in his endeavour this afternoon. I will thank all of you for your input um, as members of the committee and look forward to catching up with you. Um, Before you go. Can I ask something before you go, because um, something on the planning portal news that's come uh, through this afternoon, um, it's Johnson outlines plans to change the use class order. It would be really useful if, if Paul, uh, you might have that on one of your future agendas, but if Paul could send something around to all of his members about it, because I think we'd find it quite useful. And apparently there's a, a paper due out in, in July outlining how, uh, to quote, England's seven decade old planning system will be reformed for modern society. So if we could be, if all members could be updated, I'd, I'd think, uh, but, but particularly the use class is one. It's, it's come through on the planning portal this afternoon anyway. Thank you very much for that. I'm sure we'll pick that up. Um, thank you. I'll, I'll say thank you very much. And I will look forward to catching up with you all at our next meeting on the 17th of September. Um, if there's anything in the meantime, feel free to drop me an email or pick up the phone. Thank you. Thank it's you very, very enjoyable. Much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.